Uh, the next piece is, is fairly special. Um, it is a poem called Solace that was written by the Connecticut State uh, Poet Laureate Dick Allen at the time to commemorate the tragedy at Sandy Hook. And we, as we know, we're all uh, commemorating that 10th anniversary this week. And a year later, it was taken uh, by the composer William Bulcom and set to music. So this is uh, our performance of Solace. piece for you this evening, I just want to point out some student accomplishments from this ensemble. Um, this group really represents the, the best of what we are able to offer in terms of our music and theater arts program at Berlin High School. Um, in the group behind me, we have students who were selected for the Connecticut Music Educators Association Northern Region High School Festival uh, this upcoming January. So a handful of them auditioned. Raise your hand if you auditioned and were accepted. Uh, so we're really proud of, of them and their accomplishments there. We have a few uh, Disney characters behind me, as many of you know, we're doing Disney's The Little Mermaid the first weekend in March, and so we have an Ariel here, and we have a Prince Eric, and we have an Ursula, and we have a handful of other characters as well. Um, and it, it just goes to show how well-rounded this particular group is. They're athletes, they're some of our uh, highest achieving students, and they're some of our best musicians. So uh, very you know, grateful for all of their time and talent, certainly. And, and spending every Monday night together for the whole year is, is quite a bit of fun. Our last uh, piece this evening is Deck the Halls, a traditional car uh, carol uh, performed in a slightly untraditional way. Instead of being in the traditional meter of deck the halls with bows, where everything is nice and even, we turn this on its head a little bit, and it becomes a bit uneven. So enjoy.
board members want to share anything before they head off for the evening? There's some pretty good cookies behind you, but <laughs> <laughs> Adam so, has something to the, say. I was just going to say that last piece is incredible because you, you have that the tempo and the, the, the melody in your, in your head is uh, uh, probably very difficult to learn uh, a new way. So congratulations. That was wonderful. Yeah, a lot of talent in the room, and it was a pleasure to listen to. So, well done. Great job. Absolutely. Um, Thank, you. Well, thank you so much. Thank I always look forward when you guys come great. sing to us. So thank you. Have a great, great night, great rest of the week, and take a cookie on your way out. <laughs> <laughs> You're more than welcome to stay, but we're not going to force you to. <laughs> you have to stay. Unless you sing. Okay. All right, so we are going to move on to our next item on the agenda, um, anticipated appointment of DHS assistant principal. So I know that this process has gone through several rounds. The Board of Education um, just met with our candidate. Um, and I will turn it over to Superintendent Benigni if you have anything you would like to add. So after very extensive uh, round of interviews, we started off with um, over 90 applicants, um, and then a uh, uh, very extensive round of 20 candidates, down to 10 candidates, uh, interviews with the full administrative council, interviews with myself. We're very happy to have <coughs> Brian Pestra here as our finalist and the new assistant principal for Bowen High School. So congratulations, Brian. Would you like to step forward and say a few words, Ryan? You need to make some words. Okay, well, you know what the vote's going to be, but go ahead. Thanks. Yeah. So, do I have a motion for consideration? I move that the uh, Board of Education appoint Brian Destro to the position of Assistant Principal of Roma High School with the effective date of February 1, 2023. Do I have a second? Second. I'll second. So, I heard Carrie first. That's okay. So motion by Adam, second by Carrie. Any discussion? Brian's going to feel bad if we all vote no. I know. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, Carrie's 7 0. And now, congratulations. Yeah, congratulations. I just want to say thank you uh, to the board, uh, Superintendent Bittigny, uh Principal Eustace, uh, for you know trusting me to lead Berlin High School and be a part of that team. I'm extremely excited. I cannot wait to get started. And um, my my wife's here today with me as well. And we're we're just we're ready to go. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. And we'll get started soon. Yeah. So, Sam and I would just like to thank the Magic Elves for coming, even though they're not here anymore. But that was, I thought that was a very nice performance. We also like to congratulate the new assistant principal coming up here at BHS. And so, the first thing that I would like to talk about is on December 9th, students and teachers wore their pajamas to school and made a $1 donation in order to support cancer research at CT Children's Hospital. And this was PJ Day for the Kids. Um, and then the BHS National Honor Society helped to facilitate all the funds and donations and direct where those went. And on December 17th, the hockey team is hosting a holiday skate night at the Newington Arena. There will be an ugly sweater contest, and the event is being held from 8.30 to 10 that evening. It's $10 for entry and $3 for skate rentals, unless you attend the game beforehand, and then the skate rentals are free. All right, and as many as you um, already know, the Upbeat annual Christmas tree sales are officially canceled this year. 
Um, this become this comes because the suppliers usually send us our trees. All the trees like just happened to die this year, um, so we don't have yeah. that. But consider um, purchasing this tree from another Connecticut tree farm, and um, that's a big event for Upbeat. So supporting Upbeat in different ways, and up there are just some different things that we have coming up for Upbeat. Um, first is First Chapter Fridays. So this happened on December 9th, but what it is is Upbeat students go to the different elementary schools and they read the first chapter of a book um, to the students and they like open up discussion for talking about what they read and different like genres and things like that, um, kind of getting students into more reading and making it more exciting. Also on December 9th was the McGee drop-in. Um, I know both Upbeat students and McGee students love these. I actually went to one myself and it was a ton of fun. Um, and then on December 14th, um, I'm actually volunteering at this too, but it's the Griswold Parents Club is hosting a gingerbread decorating night, and Santa and the fire truck will be there, and the Grinch, so I think it's a really fun night for um, all the elementary school kids. And finally, the Lions and Upbeat Blood Drive will be at Griswold this um, time. Usually it's at the Berlin High School in the Age Gym, but it will be at Griswold. Uh, and Upbeat students will be there just like setting up, um, breaking down, and just being there to help anybody that's needed. <clears throat> and we also wanted to give a shout out to our Unified Basketball team and all of their members, as well as Libby Dunn, who has been hosting the Unified Golf Clinic. We know how hard all of members on each team work and hope they have a great season. And the BHS Redcoats suffered a loss in the Class M Championship against Notre Dame West Haven High School. The final score was eight to 35. Despite this challenge, the Redcoats still had an undefeated record entering the championship game. We wanted to congratulate them on an excellent season and also to the band and cheerleaders for their hard work. And I know Mr. Boyle mentioned, mentioned this earlier, but this Friday at 7 p.m. in the auditorium, the concert band and chorus will be performing their annual Pops concert. Admission is free, but in both the band and chorus have arranged, and I'm a part of the band, so complex pieces, trust me when I say this, <laughs> complex pieces for everyone's enjoyment that evening. And finally on December 8th, um, the science department hosted a field trip. They went to New York City, um, and I was a little jealous that I couldn't go. But I heard it was a lot of fun. They had breakfast in Central Park. They visited the Museum of Natural History um, with the focus of Bird, Reptile, and Amphibian Hall, as well as the Earth and Planetary Science Hall. And like I said, everybody that went loved it. Um, and I know there was a couple mishaps that happened during the trip, but all my <laughs> friends, <laughs> all of my friends that went say they really had a great time. And that's all we have for tonight. <coughs> Thank you. Any questions for Shannon? Well, I just want to clarify one thing. The football team, they were the Class M public school champions. Okay. Oh. <coughs> okay. <laughs> okay. That's a good clarification that you have. <laughs> Anything for Sam or Nan? Any questions, comments? Thank you for your wonderful response, as always. Um, okay. I'm going to turn it over to Matt. There was an ethnic committee meeting this morning. Uh, yes, we did have a, a, a Zoom meeting this morning starting at 7 a.m. Um, it turned into a rather lengthy, lengthy meeting, but it was around two very important uh, topics that um, Ashley Dorsey and her group put together for us. The first um, topic was uh, about the um, basically the budget and expenditures that we use for the Transition Academy. Uh, there's been some questions from uh, the Board of Finance relative to that, and um, Ashley put together a great report that I believe Julie was released to the Board of Finance either today or... It's going to be after the meeting. After the meeting? After the board um, that addresses the questions that they have um, relative to that this very important initiative that Berlin Schools does. Mm -hmm. um, and then we move from there into budget prep... Pre preparation as the superintendent gets ready to present in January. Um, it is challenging to put forth a budget um, for school districts on a regular year, but when you talk about kind of a perfect storm of inflation, uh, astronomical fuel costs, and now what we're hearing about energy costs, it's that much more of a challenge. So I think really this morning was to prepare us for what that's going to look like um, and try to give the superintendent a little bit of direction as to where we think we need to go. Uh, the board will hear much more on this as we get into the budget 
uh, workshops and presentations, but really was the groundwork for that. But so I, I applaud Ashley and her team for having all the information uh, together and get ready to roll up your sleeves, folks. It's going to be a long ride. Thank you, Matt. Um, I know the curriculum committee met today mm -hmm. after the FNO committee. You guys met around noon. We met at 1 p.m. Um, yeah, okay. Weekend. So I'll turn it over to you <laughs> to share. Um, I'll start, Melissa, but if there's anything I, I miss in my summary, please jump in. So it was a, a very comprehensive um, presentation um, by administrators and uh, curriculum coordinators on student achievement, wherein they presented their report on um, everything from NGSS um, to SAT to AP courses and uh, early college equivalent courses. Um, also, the presentation um, included um, ongoing work and next steps, so using those data to inform curricular changes and also to address um, needs of small groups or individual students. But they did a very comprehensive job. I'm sure the full board will um, will receive their presentation. Um, that what, that's forthcoming tonight? Okay. Yep. Did I miss anything, Melissa, that I should have? Okay, thank you. And are you going to leave this meeting with the executive board? Is that right? Not yet, no. Okay. Um, committee assignments for 2022-2023 have been sent out, but um, the community engagement committee is, Tracy will be chairing that, and uh, Gina and Peter are the members of that. Carrie will be chairing the curriculum committee, and Jamie and Melissa are members of that. And Matt is chairing the FNO committee, and Adam and myself are members of that. So that is um, the committee breakdown. The ad hoc policy committee are the committee chairs. Um, and I know there's nothing to report for tonight, correct? Right? No. Okay, correspondence to the board. Yes, I have one correspondence to the board. Uh, Central Office Staff, Board of Education, thank you for the recognition and token appreciation for my time on the board. Fantastic experience working for all of you in the entire district towards the goal of making Bowen Public Schools the best it can be. I look forward to the future success of the board and the district. Sincerely, Tim Morris. Um, okay. Um, Carrie, moving on to audio education. Do we have a motion for consideration? I move to approve the consent agenda as presented. <coughs> second. second. So motion by Melissa, second by Harry. Carrie, any discussions? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 7-0. Moving on to item A, which we um, adjusted. We are moving on to the effective school solutions presentation report.
Lindsay will share a little. Hi, nice to meet you. I know some of you. Um, I'm Nick Costardo. Here, I guess I'll just take this. So, I am a graduate of the um, Berlin School System. I've been in Berlin my whole life. Um, my mental health struggle really started for me back in middle school. Man, it definitely would have been nice to have ESS back then, but unfortunately it wasn't a thing yet, but I can definitely relate. I remember I'd miss a lot of school. It'd be so hard to get out of bed some days. Then my parents had no idea what was going on. They had no support, at least not until high school anyway. I remember I'd hide in the office all the time back in McGee. Those are some rough years, but ESS really did help me in high school. They helped me find therapists. They helped me work on my coping skills, talk to my teachers. They helped me graduate, really. I don't think I would have been able to do it without them, honestly. Like, my senior year was my best year, you know? They helped me my junior year connect with MST and work on my classes and just develop the skills I needed to finally go out in the world, get a job, go to college. I mean, yeah, it is a lot of money, but I really think it is a necessary program. I think that you guys should keep ESS on if you can. Really, it is very useful. It helped me a lot. Um, so right now, I'm going to Tungsis Community College. I'm studying general studies right now in the PAC program. So I'm doing that for two years. And after that, I might be going to UConn for medical stuff. I honestly don't know yet. I'm thinking about it. Um, and I work over at Stop and Shop, right on Farmington Ave, usually like five, six days a week. Awesome. <coughs> Thanks. Thank you. That's really awesome. Thank you for sharing that. No problem. My mom has a statement, too, if you want to hear from her. <laughs> <laughs> Not to put you on the spot or anything. <laughs> Thanks for allowing me time for me to talk uh, to you about our experience with ESS. Our Sunday course was di uh, diagnosed on the uh, autistic spectrum with autism and depression and at times crippling anxiety to the point of becoming extremely weak and resolved out of it. As you can imagine, with both my husband and I working, this was very stressful and put a strain on our family due to the multiple time periods and different school jobs. We were also fearful if we would never hold a job because of the amount of anxiety and depression. We know Nicholas was very intelligent, capable, and very friendly, spoke to us, cooking and smoking, and had a very true way he was very sweet. And he worked sweet in her team, sweet in, um, they showed Nicholas ways to push through his anxiety and unlock small success, which led to bigger success and built a solid foundation that he could fall back on as he became a young adult. And with our programs and teachings, Nicholas went from uh, failing multiple classes to a mountain of missing assignments to almost achieving, uh, oh, from, the <laughs> sorry. With our programs and teachings, Nicholas went from failing multiple classes in a mountain of missing assignments to almost achieving high honors. His senior year, he also received two awards, Student of the Month and Most Improved Student. Since graduating, Nicholas has gotten a job at the Berlin Valley Cages where he quickly made friends with many of his coworkers. He never shied away from his work or responsibilities and would often take other shifts that uh, called in. He was thanked by um, owners for his dedication and willingness to help. Without the tools that Kate and her team have given Nicholas, this never would have been possible. And currently, since the bank cages are closed for the season, Nicholas took it upon himself to get two other jobs. The first was DoorDash, which he did for about a month, but gave up due to the amount of driving. He now works at Stop and Shop, uh, which he likes very much. Nicholas is currently enrolled at Tungsten Community College, where he's taking all his core classes with the hopes to use a bridge system to get into UConn and pursue a career in the medical field. And we couldn't say thank you enough to Kay and her team and all the wonderful, kind, and truly caring teachers that work in the Berlin uh, school system. Absolutely. And I can definitely say for before ESS approached middle school, I can't even remember the person that was there, but she was a godsend because he was down at the school many times and went missing many a times. So, yes, Mr. <laughs> Manis. So I felt so bad for her because she said there were so many students going through all this. And it just like snowballed. And then high school and ESS was a godsend for us because I would bring him, where's Mr. Sosa? I would bring him to school, kicking and screaming, like literally carrying it in. Oh my gosh. So yes, it's been a struggle for us. So Berlin school system, I cannot even say thank you so much. I talk about Berlin school system all the time to other people. I say move to Berlin. They are phenomenal, <laughs> awesome people to work with. We did not have to fight tooth and nail to get services that we absolutely needed. They were like right there for us. It was an amazing experience. So thank you so much. Cannot leave ESS. They absolutely that. need this because parents, 
<coughs> the stress is ridiculous. So to have this helping hand from the school with the ESS is amazing. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think it's so important to hear the personal side of ESS. So Bethany and Lindsay are just going I gave you copies in there of testimonials from other parents and students. They're just going to read a few snippets, and then we'd like to end with one of our parents did feel comfortable to be interviewed. Um, and then if you have any questions after that. Um, so a quote from one of my parents that I work with. Um, so my son began struggling with serious depression and school anxiety during his senior year. Um, the reason that he, we were able to work through these days is because of the support we received from everybody in ESS. The support that I received enabled me to be more effective parent for my struggling teen. I truly believe if, that if it were not for this program, one or maybe both of my boys would not be graduating from school. <coughs> joined the ESS program in the middle of my freshman year. I had been struggling with depression and anxiety and was missing lots of school. Joining ESS created for me a safe and comfortable environment to be able to continue my education and overcome my mental health issues. Um, I've been working with Lindsay Gamond for a little more than a year now and she has helped me tremendously. I feel that without ESS and the help they provided me, I would not be a senior and I wouldn't be looking forward to receiving my diploma in June. Um, this is another one. After my years in ESS, I feel that they have helped me grow and manage my anger. They do their best to bring out the best in us and through our day. Another nice thing is they help us do our work. Lindsay Gamond has been a great clinician and helped me when I needed a vent. <laughs> um, and then, I don't know where I would be without ESS. Probably dead. Ms. McInerney is one of the biggest supports, if not the biggest. While in ESS, I feel heard and understood not treated like any other student who goes to see a therapist. I'm cared for. If ESS is gone, then so am I. Um, this is from a parent as well. Um, last year, our child started sixth grade at McGee, and it was an emotionally tum tumultuous year uh, from the get-go. Um, for us, the ESS program and their wonderful clinical counselor, Marissa McInerney, was literally a lifesaver. The public record shows that staff at many Connecticut schools, including McGee, are severely overwhelmed by the steep rise in need for student mental health services and the need for better spotting of symptoms of mental and behavioral problems so that kids can be helped sooner. It would be a grave mistake and a huge disservice to our children for the school board to even consider eliminating the ESS program. With such an increase in demand and prolonged shortage of available mental health services, the board must find a permanent way to retain and fund ESS in the invaluable services they provide to the town's student body. Um, Hi, my name is Kim. I have three daughters in the Berlin public school system. And I'm here to talk about the ESS program, which I think is fantastic and great and has helped my daughter tremendously. Um, she, it just helped her confidence, has helped her anxiety, and has helped her feel so much more comfortable with herself. And I think it's a great program, and I think it's very important to keep this program. We did apply for a mental health grant that's put out there um, to help fund this program again. I'm not sure if we will get it. I don't, I'm not sure when we will hear back, but we did apply. Um, and I think the state is looking for more and more ways to help fund this because, again, it's, it's, it's across the state. It's across the United States. I know Cromwell just signed on with ESS today. They have two clinicians at their high school. I think when ESS first came to Connecticut, they were Madison, Middletown, and we were the third ones to come on board. Um, and now, I don't know how many schools it's in in the state of Connecticut, but they're expanding constantly. Absolutely, yeah. some new contracts in the area as well that are coming coming up aboard. So how many years has it been now? Since 
Yeah, we saw, so um, I, I mentioned it, but I mentioned a lot of things. So we did, we do home visits and, um, you know, like typical social workers, I mean, they do do home visits, but we deliver services in, in the home. Um, and I do see that I, last year, my specific students did start coming to school. Um, so it helped with their absenteeism a lot. I don't know if you guys want to talk about that in the high school. Um, sure. Yeah. In our report card, you have two report cards in here, and it and it shows you the data in there from last year and this year about school attendance, discipline, behavior, and academics. I can just speak to years past. It looks like the report card. You know, definitely has been an increase in school attendance based on ESS data. So we were evaluating it in 2016. I can't speak to the middle school year, but I can definitely speak to the high school year as well. I was curious <coughs> if you happen to know the approximate amount, because it's a public to know, if we don't get a grant, about how much would it be just for the middle school? 110. Same as high school. We'll keep the same as high school. High school, school because we have two school. clinicians. It's, 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 yeah. Well, ES, ESS has said that we can maintain, they'll maintain the same child teacher this year. There's also a summer school component as well, so it's just not a s straight academic school year. We also offer the uh, ESY component as well. I just, I don't have a question as much as a comment, um, which is I know one of the things that, of course, we're charged with as the Board of Ed is to look at the finances <coughs> associated with this, but um, the cost of not addressing the mental health needs of young people is far greater than um, investing in this resource within our local school system. Um, and no dollar amount can be put on that in my estimation. Um, I will also say that um, it's important, I think, that as a community we recognize, and I'm gonna try to emphasize this, um, the proliferation of mental health um, challenges in our society um, has been following a steep trajectory. I'm talking to the clinicians as if they don't know this, but um, <laughs> it's been following a steep trajectory since, you know, far before the pandemic. People, it obviously was exacerbated mm. by the pandemic, but um, cu couple that with the dearth of providers available for folks in their local communities, having this resource in our schools and allowing this to be accessible to our students and our families is such a gift to our community and such a um, privilege for us to support. So I thank you for the work that you do. And Can yeah. I say something just in respect to what you were saying? Just even while Nichols was in school, we had to reach out to ECH in uh, Manchester and the one provider, the actual doctor that they had on staff, she was so overwhelmed, especially since unfortunately the pandemic like really brought incredibly hard to try to get appointments with this poor person who had an amazing amount of people to his to see and uh, it just it, we're even now trying to get something and it's still amazing the amount of time out we can get appointments and stuff mm -hmm. it's like insanely important absolutely and there are lots of communities that don't have internal mm -hmm. resources I within people come to our <laughs> 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 I also want to th say thank you for sharing your story and Nick um, I, I thank you for sharing your story. There are a lot of um, students, current students, who are challenged by some of the same um, things that you were, and adults, too, who would not be brave enough to stand up in a room of folks and share their story. So thank you very much for giving voice to that, because your story is many people's story, but you were brave enough to sit here, or stand here, I should say, and share that with us, and I thank you for that. You know what I think is important too, and we, we, you'll hear during my budget presentation, as you always do, about out of district placements. Mm -hmm. This program is more intense than an out of district placement right. because when you when we send students to out of district placements, there isn't no there isn't a family component, mm -hmm. there isn't um, weekly 
or daily group therapy, they, they get one to two 30-minute individual sessions and maybe one group therapy. There's not that intense family component. They also didn't speak about the parent support group. They also, they also do a parent support group once a month as well. So this in-house, but we get to keep our students in our own schools, in their community, with their friends, um, it's actually more intense than an out-of-district program. So Linda, I know that <clears throat> as I watch the news and read um, articles, there's that piece about, you know, especially in certain parts of the country, pushing against supporting students with mental health issues in school, saying it shouldn't be happening and it's violating parental consent and part of the 14th Amendment and so on and so forth. Can you guys just talk a little bit about um, the parents, um, are students receiving services without parental consent? Mm -hmm. It's like a team. There's a whole intake process. And, and I'm, familiar, I'm very familiar with it, but if you just yeah. want to talk about it just so we have this conversation on the record. So we work with the district on potential matches with the students. So at that point, we then um, pull in the guidance counselor, whoever the case manager might be, and they start to explore the program with the family. So right from the bat, we need that parental buy-in. Um, if I don't have a parent involved, we really can't treat the student effectively, um, which is why we have the, you know, the constant contact with the families. We need them there for therapy. We need to do family therapy. We want them to be a part of our, our parent support group. So if we don't have parental buy-in, we can't, tr unfortunately, um, treat the, their son or daughter. Um, and we've had to dismiss some kids because of that. <coughs> you know, it's just that parents are tired. They're tired by the time the kids are in, in high school and middle school, and sometimes, you know what, it's just they've been along with us for a little bit, but then the kids' needs start to fall through the cracks, the parents start to fall through the cracks. So we have lots of conversations, give them a lot of chances to say, come on, we're here to support you. Um, and sometimes we do have to dismiss because of lack of care. Mm -hmm. Not often. But I think it's important to know that students are not getting treated without parental oh, absolutely. consent, and then once mm -hmm. that happens, it's a partnership between mm -hmm. the SSS student and the parent. Julie, just another point, just so I can jump in. Yeah. All the students we treat through ESS either have, are on an IEP or a 504 plan, so it's also in their legal documents as far as services. Which I think then leads to what we were just talking about, the outplacement, and then eliminating the outplacement. Okay. And outplacing a student um, will cost roughly what? Right. What is? Anywhere up to 60 to 90 it depends which school and how much services. I mean, and, and we've had to outplace some students right. for certain, but we've also brought a couple students back. We mm -hmm. just brought a student back today. And we brought a student back last year who's actually was part of the football team. So, I mean, our kids, so when, we, when we work hard to bring them back, they are, they are showing that they can be successful back with us in our school. And, and when a student is hospitalized, the district still has to pay their educational costs while they're hospitalized. Correct. So if a student gets hospitalized for mental health related issues or, you know, related reasons um, for an extended period of time, the district is paying those costs. Correct. Any, any for 10 days. I'm even over 10 days, okay. I'm glad you, I mean, that Nick volunteered to speak and everything, because I think that that shows our whole community that the work put into the ESS and I hate to even say the money, that's why I'd ask you how much, because I wanted to, so the community would know this is, and honestly with all the work you do, I thought it was gonna be more than that. But that this is so can be so successful, and if my child had needed ESS or something like that, and I could have my child turn out to be an incredible citizen like Nick, go back to school, I mean, just like, it's incredible, and it's worth it. Um, but thank him very, thank you. Please, for coming out because you're an incredible testimony at how this program works mm. and I think people need to see that and I think it's awesome thank you anything else from the board that um, so there's only a few of us on the board still from when <coughs> we were able to introduce the program mm -hmm. Terry's one Julie's one and Julie Miller who's not here tonight um, and for the first year or two, it was grant driven. And we fought very hard to get it into the operating budget because the 
people who are in front of us today, Linda, uh, Brian, um, really brought forth the information to show how this works. But more importantly, we heard many stories, much like Nick's tonight, where this program changed the direction of their lives and in more than one occasion saved their life. We had students stand in front of us who said that they were on the verge of committing suicide mm -hmm. until this program came into effect. So in a month or so, we're going to be talking about money. And in my opinion, and I'm putting it right out there now, is this is not a program that I would support taking out of your budget. I agree. Um, it, it's too important. You can't put a price tag on these young people's lives. And uh, I would argue hard to make sure that we try to keep them. So. Thank you. Do you want to move this way? Just here. Do you guys have anything you'd like to say? I, I would just ask, <coughs> I would guess that you have data on the kids that come through the program and how you're able to track your success with the students. So in other words, if you have kids that go through and they're doing well, so wh how do you, what criteria do you base that on? Is it, okay, you know, this student is now able to function in the classroom without having to come down for, you know, a support? I mean, I'm just asking how you know that this program is successful. Obviously, if kids are, in, in this gentleman's case, he, you know, was able to graduate and, and get move on and get a job, that's, that's fantastic. But do you have, like, a, a way to as access information to see that you're actually moving forward and being successful? So we do track data, which is a part of the packet. So are you asking, like, when do, would we look at discharging a student? What would be su a successful yeah, discharge? Yeah, I guess, like, you know, an accumulative point where you're saying, okay, this person is, I don't want to say cured or, you know, just, you know what I mean, Function. just sort of ready to move on mm -hmm. and not need the services so that you know you've, you know, you've helped them and made improvement. How do you, how do you assess that? Do you have like a way to look at information? There's like so many different <laughs> ways I feel like that we assess that. <laughs> There's um, a lot. There's a bit yeah. of like a three-point rubric kind of deal that we would use, right? Like the way you would track things in an IEP. Um, there is kind of something that is similar to a three-point rubric um, in terms of, you know, is the student able to reset on their own with help, right. with right. supports, so things like that. you have your own set of criteria that they need to meet yes. in order to sort of, yeah. There's also ex extensive documentation, and our company has a specific electronic medical system that is... Right. Okay. Also charting though, um, how many uh, how many unexcused absences have they had? What's their GPA? What level? We we have a level system, mm -hmm. so the kids can like move up when they're doing well, and um, and we send all of that goes to um, you know our regional director wh who Kate you just showed me something the other day where all that data was compiled together and. It, I think the sheet just got past the law. Oh, perfect. Yes. yes. Yeah. So, so um, that's in your packet. That's called the report card. Gina, oh, so okay. that's that's the data that they give to us twice a year. So we get something mid year. Okay, so there's like a more time <coughs> so every single week we're a taking snapshot. We're, we're doing we're, yeah, yeah, yeah right. absolutely. That's right. And then that's there's right. other ways that we do that um, through like the their IEPs, right? Like we're tracking behavioral data, we're tracking whether or not they're staying in the classroom, how much time out of the classroom they are, and every tool looks different. Um, but that's stuff that we discuss every week at our IDT meetings and you know, depending on where they are, they, they can get discharged for being successful. Right. Yeah. Discharge, that's the word. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Thank you. I, I just want to say that the, um, thank you again. I mean, the personal stories we've heard, uh, you know, over the years, you know, sadly during budget season. Uh, but I think that the personal stories are the most impactful for people that are here. So, thank mm -hmm. you. Since this has been in and after the grant went away and then we had to find money in the town and everything, and we all know that mental health issues are huge and sadly on the rise. Is this something that this program is going to have to go through every time a budget comes around that they're going to have to pull resources together to prove their point that they're very helpful in the community? Or will this ever be sustainable and if they want to do this? I'll have the superintendent speak to that a little bit. We went through that with the high school program to get it to be in the operating <coughs> budget, and now we're going to have to follow the same process for the middle school program. Mike, do you want to speak to that? I think the difficult part with the budget every year, and not that we haven't received you know, adequate funding, but 
uh, for, for a number of years, we received in the 1% range. 1% doesn't allow us to maintain staff. So uh, during those during that era is when we first started ESS because the need was so so strong. We first put it in the grant and then moved it to the budget. But right now, looking at the budget year to, you know, year, to year, we need over 4% to maintain the current staff that we have. We were receiving last year in the twos, and this year we've been asked to, that doesn't mean the board's doing it, to come in at a 2% budget, which would mean we couldn't even maintain the staffing that we have with the contractual obligations for all the unions and insurance and so on. So the big thing is having that adequate funding, and that's really, you know, when it gets to the referendum and the vote of the town, that's and we've been very fortunate that the, the community has supported an increase of the budget every year. But we really need above 3%, you know, and that's what's going to get us to where we need to be. It doesn't mean that we don't want this program, or that you heard many of us support this program, or it won't be part of it because the need is there. We recognize that. We also recognize what the program impact that it has that we heard tonight from your son, but we've also heard from many others and, and parents too, what, what it's done. And, and some of us said, as you said this evening, it saved, it saved my son or it saved my daughter. And you know, that, that, is, that is at the paramount of what we do, right? And that's mm -hmm. so, um, we have to maintain that. But if you ask why we, every year it comes up, it's because every year we're fighting for every dollar to maintain what we currently have. That, that's, that's really the issue. Anyone else on the board want to ask or comment? Thank well, thank you so much. Do you have any closing thoughts or are you going to wrap up? Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so thank much. You for coming. Moving on to Berlin High School program. I'm alone. <laughs> I won't have to torture you too much this year as I have in years past with a lot of changes. So um, thank you so much. It's great to see everybody and I'm very happy to present uh, the few changes that we have moving forward. So I'm following along in the significant changes document. So um, that would be the best point of reference um, for the information. So just to begin with, we just did a little bit of reformatting of information in the front as well as moved a little bit of information to the back. Uh, we included the vision of the graduate that um, we recently rolled out. And the other thing too is we wanted to make sure that we were communicating uh, certain things related to uh, advanced courses, GPA calculation, et cetera, which is per state mandate, which has also been recently adopted as part of new policy, ensuring that we're communicating that with fam families. Uh, the next thing is the graduation requirements, which I believe you're, uh, you've already spoken about, as well as that will come up later in the agenda. Um, and I, that through the policy committee. So that was, uh, the request was made we wanted to move for uh, we wanted to move forward with reducing the number of credits for seniors to six uh, credits instead of a, a mandated seven credits that they have to take. In running the data for the last few years, it's fewer than 10 percent of our students actually need seven credits senior year. So oftentimes, what happens is they're sitting in classes, um, taking seats um, for classes that they may or may not need, and then sometimes. Um, students may or may not always put a lot of effort forward if they know they don't necessarily need that class to graduate. And I want to say that's not, that's not widespread, but if you think about it, they're taking a seat from another student that may really want to be sitting in a class, and that, that does become a challenge for us, particularly with elective classes. The other thing that I want to emphasize with allowing grade 12 students reduced to six credits is if, as we continue to move forward with making um, opportunities available for career connected learning and getting students out doing um, industry uh, opportunities, uh, job shadows, potential internships, things like that. We need to try to free their schedules up a little bit more and this will also provide us with an opportunity to be able to do that. Um, one of the things our work-based learning coordinator is running up against is she's uh, coordinating a lot of opportunities is kids don't like to be out of school. They don't like to miss a lot of class, which is a great thing, but we also need to continue to think flexibly about student schedules in order for them to get those authentic opportunities. The other thing connected to the graduation requirements is just a minor uh, change in terms of the STEM credits. All students have to earn nine STEM credits. 
and we wanted to include uh, a handful of the designated, uh, we have a handful of business courses that we will designate that can fall appropriately in the STEM credit. So accounting, our accounting classes, as well as a business technologies class, which really is very appropriate um, to count towards STEM credit. So as far as uh, courses, so under uh, CTE, Career and Technical Education, we have, it, which is Business, Family, Consumer Science, and Technology Education, uh, just a few of the changes that we have forward. Um, the first one talks about Intro to Business. I would say this really isn't a new course. It's actually a little bit repackaged. We used to have a year-long business survey class. Then last year, we adjusted it to a half-year course of Intro to Business, and this is just a further adjustment. We found that we have students that when they want to explore business, they may really want to go into that finance accounting area, or they may want to do more business administration and management. So we have two introductory courses um, based on that, and you can see the various topics that will be covered in each of those introductory courses, and they will each be a half credit. In terms of the other offering change, I'm really excited about the next one. We're expanding our partnership with Southern Connecticut State University. If you recall this year, we developed a partnership with them and offered zoology for students to earn early college credit. And uh, we can now also articulate our current business law class with Southern Connecticut next year. Fortunately, Mr. Jones is someone who actually serves on faculty at Southern. So um, that was a very seamless transition and we're um, excited to be able to offer that additional opportunity for early college credit. Another change that we have made is the business technologies and application class. Used to be a full year. We now want to, we're offering it as a half year class. Um, really our students are coming into high school, they're, they're far more exposed to technology. A course like that really doesn't need to be a full year. And I will say one of the things that we've tried to do is to move more of our elective classes to half year classes. It provides a lot more flexibility in students um, scheduling classes and hopefully getting all of the things that they want. On the next page, uh, Family and Consumer Science, one course that we're suspending at this point is the Child Development 2. We have great success with a number of students entering Child Development 1, and typically they're, they're fine and they're well-versed to go into uh, the UConn uh, next level of uh, Child Development, the family, uh, the family class. So they really don't need that second layer of Child Development 2. In technology education, we are now going to be offering a CNA course, a Certified Nursing Assistant. So last spring, as well as this past fall, we offered this, uh, I wouldn't say it was an official course for the high school, but we offered an opportunity for students. We partnered with Tunxis, and uh, we offered an opportunity for students to get certified. Uh, the way in which we were offering it, it was completely offered outside of school. Um, Ann went through the program last spring, successful graduate, very excited about that. So um, they took their classes at, we, we had a little bit of a different setup, but they were taking their classes at Tunxis. We were also able to use Tunxis resources in terms of their clinical visits and that's and that, and we really wanted to work to bring that into the high school. So we will now be offering that as part of our course of studies. The class itself will be offered during the school day. It does require clinical hours, which will be a combination of during in, in school as well as out of school. So um, for any student that signs up for that course, I will we will make sure that we have a meeting because there's a few things that go along with that class that has, has to do, you can see there's few things down at the bottom there that talk about you have to have certain vaccinations and all of those kinds of things. Um, but we're really excited to partner with Tunxis and they, the people as part of their allied health uh, program there have been, they love our students. They are um, very excited to work with us and this is really an interest, this is a new partnership that we're looking to build with them. So while we're going to offer the course here at the high school, we're going to partner with Tunxis for them to provide the curriculum as well as the instruction. So it allows us to use their resources, um, which could be really challenging for us if we were on a continual basis trying to find instructors for that. So we're very excited about that opportunity. Students, if six, you know, as they go through successfully, they will have an opportunity to earn an industry-recognized credential as a CNA and be able to go out and work. So we're very excited about that offering. Underneath Fine Arts, we have a few changes. Um, within the music department, we have the treble chorale and men's 
uh, choir is going to be con uh, combined for concert choir. We actually have had that as a caveat in the program of studies that if we don't necessarily have enough students to run either, we would combine them anyway. So at this point, we're moving forward with a combined concert choir. Um, men's choir, the few years that it was able to run was very successful. Um, but again, this provides a little bit more flexibility with scheduling um, by combining the groups. Theater one will now just be theater. Um, you'll see further down that we'll be suspending theater two just due to um, lack of enrollment in terms of getting um, students as they continue in the theater two um, class. Part of that has to do with uh, challenges with scheduling. They just can't fit these things in their schedule. And um, the other thing too is we have a very robust co-curricular program when it comes to uh, theater, our theater program. So students are having an opportunity to experience uh, theater as well as technical theater through our co-curricular programs. And I would also argue that they get a lot of technical theater uh, work done with um, through our digital video production work as well. Um, and then as far as a new course is concerned, we're offering unified theater. So one of the things that we have done, we actually piloted this last school year. So when we look for scheduling, especially students that have significant needs in our building, we want them to graduate from Berlin High School earning all of the graduation requirements. And because there's a fine arts requirement, we were trying to figure out a way, how do we go about having them, you know, uh, creating that experience for them. So we piloted Unified Theater during the school day. It was a great opportunity, not only for our students with disabilities, but also for their peers as well, their partners. And it has, it has been incredibly successful. So uh, what we're going to do is do an alt, we're, gonna, we're going to alternate because if you turn to the next page, you'll notice that next year we're offering unified art. So what we'll do, this will allow our students with significant disabilities to not only earn their graduation requirement, but it also offers our, their, their peer students uh, an opportunity to earn their fine arts credit for those that really enjoy working with those students or potentially are looking at careers in working with students with significant needs. So it is a really wonderful opportunity. We're very excited about it. It's been successful. We've had Unified PE, we expanded into Unified Theater, and now we're going to expand into Unified Art. I do also think it allows an opportunity for, uh, from a curriculum level, uh, from a curriculum basis for that to, the teacher can really plan accordingly, um, know it, in terms of developing a curriculum for unified art as well. Any questions related to the fine arts changes or updates? Okay. In science, just to let you know, we're making some credit adjustments. You'll notice a number of courses that are moving from either 1.25 to 1.0 um, and so forth. You can look down the list. We have um, been in conversation about this for a very long time. And when we moved to the block schedule, we were able to move forward with, uh, it created flexibility as when you could run a lab period. If you think about it, lab periods were originally put in place um, back when classes were typically 40 or 45 minutes, right? Not enough time to run a real lab experience. So that's where the notion of a double period would come into play. Also back in the day, right, where you didn't necessarily have, every science teacher didn't have a lab classroom. They were sharing, they were, right, going to the lab room. So as we've continued to evolve and as we moved into the block schedule, we were actually able, science teachers are now, they can run a lab because they have a 90 minute class every other day. They're able to run a lab as appropriate, you know, any, any time in that rotation as it's appropriate for the, for the curriculum as well as the learning. The other thing too is one of the other things that we were really looking at in terms of removing the lab period is it's a major constraint on student schedules. So what you need to realize is, right, your science class meets, my, my science class will meet, if I'm a period one, I'm gonna meet on um, the odd days, one, three, five, and then I'm going to have an additional lab period, maybe period two. What that does is that one additional lab period completely wipes out period two to take any additional courses. So it really will free up opportunities for students to take additional courses. One of the things that we've noticed that with the increased graduation requirements going to at the state level for 25 and how it's pretty prescribed, we feel as though our students have lost some opportunities to personalize their schedules and take elective areas. By removing the lab in these particular courses, that opens up 
a minimum, it opens up a minimum of four semesters for students to pick up additional, whether it is core or elective courses. And I really think that opens the door for them to personalize their schedules more and to take courses of interest. Would you say that sometimes the lab jams things up a little bit? <laughs> Right. Yeah. So now keep in mind with um, AP and ECE, they will maintain the additional lab. They need to do that in order to cover the curriculum. Um, the UConn classes are eight credits. Uh, some of the, the UConn classes, with the exception of the environmental, are eight credits. So they need that lab time as well as the, um, the AP. The other change that's happening in science is we've always run this as a dual class, the AP UConn ECE physics. Um, and what, and we, it really doesn't align. I met with all of the science teachers a year ago to ask the question of does the AP curriculum align with the UConn curriculum? And in, in the science, and in all the classes where we're offering it, we have uh, one math class and then three other science classes, it aligns very tightly to the UConn curriculum, the AP does um, in those areas, with the exception of physics. Physics, the AP physics just does not align with the UConn curriculum. And so we've made a decision so in, to not offer it as a dual enrolled class. They really cover the AP curriculum so early on in the year that by the time the exam even rolls around, like they're so far past that curriculum that it doesn't make sense. And we decided to continue with the UConn class because we feel it is a bit of a more robust curriculum. Students are earning eight credits and we've had really good, our students have had very good success with the UConn portion of that. So we made a decision to unravel that a little bit, and we think that that's going to be a really smart choice. And then finally, in social studies, the first is just a very quick tweak. Per as as you recall, we are we're mandated to offer the African American, Black, and Latino studies class. Um, it is a full year class, but the state has allowed some latitude in order for us to offer it as two semester classes because it may serve as a deterrent if it's a full year class. Some students may, na may not be able to fit that course. So now being able, you can either take both semesters to equal a full year or you can take one semester or another semester. So students will have that option. And then the other class we're suspending at this point is Sports and American Society. Um, that course has not run in about six or seven years. So we just don't get enough enrollment in order for that class to run. So any questions with regard to the changes? Before we open it up to discussion, let's just have a motion for consideration and a second, then we can open it up for discussion. Um, I'll move to approve new course offerings and revisions to the Broma High School program of studies for 2023-2024 as presented. Second. We have a motion by Adam and a second by Matt. Now let's open it up for discussion and question. Just a, a question on your, uh, uh, for science, reducing the credits from like 1.25 to 1, or whatever, does that throw anybody's current schedule? I'm, I'm kind of looking at Patty too. Like as you're planning out your, your career in high school, does it, it doesn't negatively impact anybody? Okay. No, because you're only picking up a 0.25 okay. for an entire year. Oh and it eats up an entire period. So you actually have an opportunity to pick up 0.5 or even potentially a 1.0 okay. oh. by being able to add more classes. So. I'm still looking for the discrete math or something like that. Didn't it's you? running this it's year. Running? Yes, yes, Fine. we finally Fine. got it to run. So we're very excited yes. about that. So. Anything else? Just a, a comment. I think the first time you presented revisions and changes is very lengthy. It yes. seems like things are getting refined over the years and mm -hmm. really tightening it down. So, I mean, kudos to, to you and everyone at the high school that's been working on this because it looks like it's uh, really good shape. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll um, kind of piggyback on what Adam just said. Just as a member of the curriculum committee, um, you know, when <coughs> you and your team presented this, obviously you spoke to it here tonight, but it's clear that the decisions that have been made are well-informed and thoughtful <laughs> and um, really student-centered. So I commend you for maintaining that focus. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. <laughs>
Yeah, we're excited. It does have a limited enrollment, which is fine. So we're we're excited to be able to offer it, and partic we're particularly excited to partner with Tunxis in terms of the offering. I, that's that's really fantastic for us. Put it up though. Okay, cool. Now I'm excited, so go ahead. I just think it's important to note that we have a new structural model of having two directors of curriculum and not having two superintendents. But we also restructured to now having six plus supervisors. The six plus supervisors are also here this evening to help present on this. So uh, it's been a model that we looked at for years. And uh, right now I feel the model is being very effective. I know that the middle school has welcomed having six plus supervisors there um, to assist. So I'm going to turn it over to them. So thank you. Um, we do have the department supervisors, Lori Pasewicz, Jeff Conk, Adam Leonard, and Ross Hansen, who are here tonight to help us with the SAT portion because they're doing so much with that area. Um, and they're also doing things with Smarter Balance in the middle school. So, but we didn't want to give them everything their first year. <laughs> <laughs> but we also um, have to thank uh, Eileen and all of the principals and Patty Pyrus um, for just all of their input into the presentation and also thank Laura Curtis who's our district data person who really pulled all of the data for us time and time again when we kept going back from there. So just an overview on um, the Smarter Balance NGSS and SATs are required by federal law they are there to um, address achievement and growth. They look at program evaluation as well as accountability. The hope is that by the end of this time, we have college students who are college and career ready. And we always look at it as that one snapshot and it can be used to combined with all other measures to make sure that our students are growing or that there are areas where we need to improve. Smarter Balance is administered generally in April through May. It's open, we can um, do it in February through June. We do the majority of the testing in April and May. It's computer adaptive, meaning that as students answer, que answer questions, the um, questions get either a little bit more difficult or easier. Um, when it first came out, they said it was gonna be all adaptive. It stays within the grade level. So if you're in third grade, there are only going to be questions that a third grader can answer. It's not going to get very difficult or very easy. Um, we get reports back and they tell us the achievement levels of students and their levels one through four, three is meeting expectations. Um, and then we get individual student reports and those go out to families when we receive them. It's usually at the end of September, beginning of October. So since we take Smarter Balanced yearly from third through eighth grade, in addition to actually getting our levels of achievement, our ones, twos, threes, and fours, we are also able to look at growth of students from year to year. That actually started back in the 2016 administration of Smarter Balanced, and we've been looking at that ever since. Last year in our report, we were not able to look at that because we did not test in 2020. So in 2021, there had been a gap. This year, um, we were able to look at our 21 to 22 growth, which we will talk about as part of our presentation. We wanted to make sure that everybody was aware of the different types of things we look at with growth. There are actually two different ways it's measured. The first is growth rate, and that's basically a yes or no. So students are assigned a growth target, a certain amount of points that they are expected to grow each year, and they either meet that growth target or they do not. So that's reported as a yes or no, very simple. 
The second type is our average percentage of target achieved. We call that our APTA. And there we can actually look at the percent of growth a student has made, even if it's not 100%. And we'll actually show a quick sample to help make sense of that. So in this model here, we have four students, samples A, B, C, and D. All of these students are assigned a growth target of 60 points. That's in the blue. Student one made 42 points of growth. So no, they did not meet their growth target of 60, but they made 70% of that, so that's their percentage. Second student made exactly a 60-point growth, so they are at that 100%. They are a yes for growth rate and 100% for their percentage. The next student actually exceeded at 66 points, so they are also a yes, and they have a max of 110. The growth actually goes from 0 to 110%. They do not um, allow anything past that either way because then we could get skewed data from some significant outliers. And then our final student made 36 points of growth, so they were a no for the growth rate but had a 60% gain. And so if they average all of these out, 50% of students met their growth rate, and then it was 85% of students of the four um, for their percentage. So that's how those two measures work, and we'll get to some slides that actually show that for our district. The next slide is not about Berlin specifically. This is about the state of Connecticut and our data trends. Again, in 2020 to 2021, um, when we started testing again after the year where we did not need to test, we cannot actually look at um, this past year versus the 2021 year because they reported out in very different ways that year based on fully remote, hybrid, in-person, and so you can't actually average all of that together without getting skewed data. So we are actually able to look at our pre-COVID, post-COVID here with 2019 and 2022 testing. <coughs> and you'll see as a state, we are still not quite back to where we were before the pandemic, um, but we're hopeful that we'll continue to make growth. So that's our students without and students with high needs for ELA and math across the state. So we'll start with English language arts test. If you take a look all the way to the right, that uh, yellow highlighted column, that's uh, the achievement of our students and those students who receive uh, level three or four. So again, meeting expectations is a level three. And that shows you from grade three through grade eight. Is this specific now? For 22 the for Berlin. This is just showing it in a um, visually different manner. You can see where uh, the red, where the does not meet, grows and gets smaller. Again, these are different students. And this is taking a look at the subgroup performance. So, you can look at it by grade level, three through eight. This is showing all students, our high need students, which are students who are English learners, receiving free and reduced lunches, and students with disabilities. And then that last row is students with disabilities. What's the, what's the asterisk with uh, grade four? Yeah, so that it's less than 20 students. Uh, that's particularly, I think it's 19 students. And so the state doesn't consider it a subgroup unless there are 20 students. So it's important to recognize that the students with disabilities are in all of those rows. So the students with disabilities are included in all students. They're included in high need students. And they're included obviously in students with disabilities. And just as an FYI, all students, all teachers, and all reading teachers have access to the data warehouse, which has all of this information in it. So smarter balance, balance scores are one data point that they look at at the beginning of the year. And they use that in conjunction with the beginning of the year assessments. And that then tells them the level of ser services that a student needs, as well as the type of service a student needs. So. We don't look at a student and say, oh, 
this is where you are. We say, this is where you are because of X, and so this is what you need in order to move forward. As described by Cara, um, these next slides are gonna be focused on the growth of students. So we start with grade four because grade three doesn't have anything to compare with. And the top graph is the yes or no graph. They either met or they didn't meet their growth target. The bottom graph shows the percent of the target that the students achieve. So they might not have made the entire growth, but they made partial growth. And so that tells you what percentage was made. <coughs> so here's fifth grade. So it looks like, oh, in sixth grade, you know, we did really well in English learners. Our N was one. So that's one student. <laughs> and that student represented us well. Yes. <laughs> and we're quite thankful. So. Um, seventh grade. And so this is actually a good one. The seventh grade is a good one to talk a little bit about. So if you look at the English learner, so they had a zero on um, their growth target, <coughs> excuse me, but they received 33% of their total growth. But it's just easy to see the difference. I'm not saying 33% is wonderful, but what I am saying is that you, it just illustrates well the difference between a growth target and the APTA. And then eighth grade. <coughs> When we take a look at the DER comparison, not where we want to be. However, it is similar to where we were pre-pandemic. So there hasn't been a huge growth drop off. Are we okay to move on to math? All right, so this will look very similar to what you just saw for our ELA. Here are our math scores for 2022, grades three through eight. And just to point out a, a couple of things really quickly, fifth grade, thinking back um, over the last several years, that tends to be one of the lower performing areas, not just in Berlin, but um, across the state and nationally. That is a grade level where we actually have a lot of application of prior skills. So third and fourth grade, <coughs> our multiplication division and our fraction work is foundational. That's where students are doing a lot of the basics and learning. And then in fifth grade, those areas become application-based. There's a lot more language, a lot more um, problem solving involved. And so we have been really looking at the curriculum, not just in fifth grade, but prior to, to really better align and include more rigor so that hopefully that will help us in fifth grade. And then in eighth grade, we also tend to see a dip. In this particular case, we feel strongly that that has to do with the impact of COVID on our students with disabilities. When you see our, our data later on, um, our students with disabilities in eighth grade are struggling with this assessment. These are students who in sixth grade went out for the spring, and then in seventh grade were mainly hybrid, remote, um, and that really impacted how things worked for them. So. We are really trying to do our best to bring them to where they need to be. But that definitely impacted our scores in eighth grade. And here's just again another visual where we look at our performance in levels one, two, three, and four. And a number of our grades, our level four is equal to, if not <laughs> a little bit greater than our meeting. And here are our subgroups, all students high needs, students with disabilities. And again, the same thing, grade four, we had less than 20 students, we had 19. And to speak to, similarly to Lori, when we have students and we're looking at their data, smarter balanced in addition to unit assessments, benchmarks, um, screeners, things like that, we use all of that information to identify if students have a need um, to work with our math specialists or paras we use our data warehouse regularly, and we analyze that data. 
We support our tier one with coaching, uh, modeling, working with some of our new resources. We have screeners that we use with students to determine the level of support they will need. And then a lot of our students in elementary who are getting tiered intervention are now using a Bridges intervention program, which is very specific um, and progressive. And then we also in our data warehouse are able to do progress monitoring. So that's been really helpful to us. So those are some newer things. And again, our subgroups with growth, weight, gr growth rate and target achieved. This is our fourth grade. What's interesting is you go across the grades when you look at the bottom part of the graph with the, the target achieved, the percentages, very consistent across our groups. And this is across all of our grades. This is our fifth grade. Those are actually pretty good shape. Sixth grade, this is again where we only had one English learner and that English learner did very, very well. <laughs> Over 100%. Seventh grade. So then in seventh grade, that was another group where we actually only had, I believe, two English learners, and they both met, if not exceeded, their target. And then eighth grade. Eighth grade was the group, as I mentioned, we had our largest population in eighth grade last year of students with disabilities. We actually had about 20% of our test takers. And during comparison, ELA and math were pretty much right on track with each other and again in the same place we were pre-COVID. And these are these scores here are an average of all levels together. So third through eighth grade. This is not done grade by grade. So some of the areas that we're working on at the elementary and middle schools, um, certainly providing prof professional development and looking at resources that are being used in all areas. Um, related to um, Smarter Balance in grades six through eight, the um, department chairs have really worked to identify uh, their SLOs and their goal, their personal goals that they're working on to align with improvement as we move forward. Um, we're constantly looking at our units of instruction and, and expectations for literacy and math and although we're looking at it in articulation among the grades, we're also looking at it with um, various subjects. So it's not just on the English teacher and it's not just on the math teacher. It's what else can be supported in other areas as well. Um, in terms of preparation, we are using the interim assessments. So those are kind of like practice problems things that you can use. You can give them as formal assessments or you can use them instructionally. So we are doing that in both areas. We have expectations that where they're regularly incorporated into the curriculum and we actually have points in the year where certain interims are used as actual assessments that we score. Um, we are also bringing back vertical teams. We had not had them in a couple of years and really looking at that vertical alignment. In addition, the data warehouse was something new this past year that we started working with, so we are continuing to build that and really make that a part of what we look at regularly to dig into our data. And that has been a huge help, particularly at elementary where we were using individual Google, Google Sheets for the last several years and really couldn't look um, at how students had been doing in terms of trends and past data. So, All right. Questions? Surprised by any, any of the uh, data that you've seen? I mean, post COVID. So, not surprised in that we expect there to be um, some slips. However, we do have certain areas that we continue to look at, and and especially the growth data. That's the part that we really want to look at because it's measuring students against themselves, and that to us is the more important part. Mm -hmm. And with that, every student is expected to make growth. So even if you're already at an exceeding, you still have a growth target to continue to stay at an exceeding level. Because this assessment is not set up where you're jumping level by level. It can actually take several years, even if you meet your growth target, to move from one level to another. Um, so we really need to keep looking at the growth and not just students who are underperforming, but students who are already at that exceeding level. 
so it's important all around, making sure the opportunities we provide meet their needs. Um, but we continue to look at our programming, and we've definitely made some improvements to our support structures, and we're working in connection with special education. We actually have our math and literacy specialist rotating and attending special education vertical team meetings. Um, some of the resources we're using, for instance, that Bridges Intervention I mentioned is new this year, actually last spring. Our special education teachers are also now using that at elementary and somewhat with some of our students in middle school. And so there's more consistency um, and collaboration with that. So we're hopeful that these will help us. Just make a comment. I think one of the major issues has been the data system. We had a data system. We waited for, I think it was Pearson with their vice president coming in, putting in a data system before COVID. <laughs> waiting a year and a half, never bringing the, the system to fruition. We were uh, with other districts, such as Farmington, was waiting also. Now having the data system look at the data like we used to do, is g it will make a large difference in, in what's going on. The part that is of concern, and I'll say that here and that I would expect next year to be much higher, is that growth data, measuring students against themselves. The adage that's in the district, and I've said it at faculty meetings, I've said it across district, is, None of us would want to do something for 181 days and not improve. So every student should improve. If they're not improving, we want to know why they're not improving. And then that's where we have different resources, whether it's, whether it's meeting with certain staff to figure out why that student's having an issue and not being able to achieve their growth target. You know, as Cara said, jumping from band to band may take multiple years, but when you're measuring against yourself, you want to see the ongoing improvement, mm -hmm. regardless of what subgroup you're in. So, um, you know, when I looked at the data, that was the part that struck me the most is, you know, overall, you know, looking at what <coughs> percentage we have at level three or level four, well, we've always looked at that data, but now with growth targets that the state are saying are very predictive based on thousands of data points, we need to focus on that as the target, and then over time, the, the level threes and fours will, will also increase. But um, I think the data system of bringing back the use of data with staff as we did, you know, uh, years ago will help inform the instruction and also know where students are. So I, I think if you, you ask the question, well, did any of it concern you? That's the part that's of, of most, most concern to me. And our principals have been digging into the data system. They're using this regularly at any meetings where we're discussing students and they're meeting with individual teachers to look at their student performance and talk about areas that they need to work on and how to support the students. So we're, we're digging in at the ground level. So just, um, just looking at it, um, I obviously the data is so important because then you can, you know, figure out like you said certain points and so on. Um, just kind of, you know, going back to the growth and any growth whatsoever, you know, is a positive. That's what you want to see with each kid. And I only speak as myself, and I think it was uh, with the presentation with the SATs as a someone that is not a good test taker. Have any of the teachers like found that you know they met growth in an area, but it might not show through this test? I mean, obviously, there's different ways to evaluate. Um, this isn't just the one. I was just curious, especially with anxiety and you know everything like that on the rise. Just curious. Yeah. So it's important for us always to look at all of the different data points that we have on students and that's that's a good point our concern though is we do want to make sure that we're seeing growth and so that's the part that we'll continue to fall back on but you're right some of these could be false scores you know kids come in they're not feeling well they're taking a test they might have anxiety about test taking <coughs> so but teachers are pretty good at keeping notes <coughs> on their students we ask them to monitor anything that happens during the test taking and they hold on to that so that when we go back to them we can say anything happened with Lori during that mm -hmm. during that test and they pull out their notes and they can say oh yeah she came in and she had a cold a head cold and had her head on the desk for we 20 finished, minutes we finished in five minutes <laughs> M many <laughs> teachers have a good understanding of how their students will achieve on the assessment before they even take the assessment mm -hmm. and so that understanding of a student who is suffering from test anxiety and or hasn't been successful in any of the practice, pra practice assessments. Hopefully you see that, and then whatever you can do to help the student to eliminate that. But you're right, you can't have some students that just don't take a standardized test well. 
but we're trying to work through various ways to have them practice in that type of format so they can be successful. Because at some point, you're going to take standardized assessments, standardized assessments, whether it's the SATs at the high school level, mm -hmm. entrance exam, and ACTs, they're going to have to sit in that type of environment. So it's important that they develop that skill set. I think one of the things that we talked about earlier with this presentation on the curriculum <laughs> committee meeting um, uh, is the idea that, you know, these data are, are important in terms of informing curricular changes and making some, but, you know, my question, right, was how are these data being used to inform individual right, interventions for individuals if they're needed? I mean, just to kind of go back to what Melissa was saying, I mean, I know that no decisions are made for students based on one data point. And so, you know, you're cross-referencing this with teacher reports and other assessments of student performance and so forth. I mean, to me, of course, this is sort of a 30,000 foot view for our district and then drilling down and then, you know, subsequently evaluating whether there are certain grade levels that are um, falling short of the mark or subgroups as you, and, and then obviously down to the individual student. but. Um, you spoke a little bit about some of those things earlier today too, so I just want to put that out there for everyone because I we are privy to some more information having been through this just, you know, six hours ago. <laughs> yes. And we're glad you brought up your question earlier. It helped us to frame a little bit more about that. Oh, good. Tonight. Thank you. <laughs> good. I'm glad you received it that way. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Of course. All right. We are going to do our NGSS next and Adam Leonard going to join me up here. I will just do the clicker for you. We'll do a cartwheel on this. We could. <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> I would All love right. to see that. <laughs> that, that might be. I'd probably dislocate <laughs> something. Or, you know. And then it would be worker's comp. And then <laughs> it's right there. So. All right. All right. So I'm here to talk about NGSS, which is the Next Generation Science Standards. Uh, this is a test that's administered at three different grade levels, uh, one at the elementary in grade five, one at the middle school in grade eight, one at the high school level in grade nine. As you can see up there, it's also an online test. So um, the nature of the test is that students are kind of given a lot of robust information, background information. They have some interactives where they can collect data, analyze it. Um, and make conclusions, predictions, models, things within that range. Uh, the scoring of the students is similar to the previous results that we just saw, so ranging from one to four, four being the best. Um, and there's quite a ro robust number of standards um, that go across all grade levels in our science content. So it's, it's quite a big scope and sequence. It also includes a lot of the science uh, and engineering practices that are embedded as well. Um, students test in the springtime, so elementary is in May, and the secondary levels are both in April, um, somewhere a little after April vacation usually. Um, at the high school level, we have to weigh when they take that test because a lot of the students will also be taking AP tests or finals for the, their UConn courses as well. So we have to have it in that last week of April, um, generally speaking. Then we get our results in September, October, like the other results. Um, this is Connecticut statewide data, so this is not our data, but you can see um, there's two different colored bars on here. The blue bar is the 18-19 school year, which is the first time the NGSS test was administered. Then the 19-20 year, we know what happened there. And then the 20-21 um, year, just like with SBAC, um, there were students who were remote or hybrid, so the state didn't report out on data as far as that. You can see Generally speaking, um, you can see the different groups, the students without needs um, and students with needs through the three grade bands and that, just like with this fact, there was a slight decline in that, um, presumably connected with the pandemic. Um, 
going forward, this is um, our data from the 2022 administration that just happened in the, sp in the spring. Um, you can see that the numbers in the yellow that are highlighted are our students who are meeting goal or exceeding. Um, and you can see that that's pretty consistent across the three different grade bands. In this graphic, you can actually see uh, the swath of students that occupy each of those in, in a little more of a visual basis. One of the things that we've been working at at the high school is to narrow that yellow uh, band, um, and that's something that we were able to do, and that led to growing uh, the green band where students meet the goal on this test. Uh, you can see where we fall. Um, one thing to note, you see that the uh, highlighted number, the 58.1, is an average of all the grade levels for the 2022 test administration. Um, and you can see where we fall compared to other districts um, within the DERG. Uh, taking a look at this, um, we have our three different grade levels, 5, 8, and 11. Uh, as you saw with SPAC, we have all the students that are included and their number up at the top. Below are the students with high needs, and then on the, on, uh, the lowest area, we see students with disabilities and their percentages. Uh, keep in mind, students with disabilities are also included in the other, other two rows as well. Uh, some of the things, Sorry. that's right. Some of the things that we're working on. Um, one of the things that I started in June was the uh, reinstatement of the vertical team. So, um, you know, as things kind of changed with COVID and stuff like that, this is definitely the appropriate time, um, especially once I got put into this position. It allowed me to work with the middle school team as well. So from the middle school, we have representation of each grade level. And from the high school, we have representation of each content area. So we're able to have very rich discussion as far as what's going on uh, for a student 612. And one of the things that have been released by the state, and these, these were released in January of 2021, were these um, practice tests, if you will. They're called interim assessments. So the state came out with a program. It looks just like the actual NGSS test. The students can select standards and administer those. Um, so one of the things that we started to do for the 6-8 team and the 9-12 team is identify what <coughs> what those particular assessments look like and where they fit within our current curriculum. The vertical teams taking a look at our current curriculum, seeing, um, and we've essentially mapped it out, or in the process of mapping out what standards are being met and at what grade level and at the high school what course level. So we're able to really align this um, pretty nicely. So some of the professional development that we're doing. We met in November, and the next meeting's in February. We also have um, a program called Gizmos. We have a three-year subscription to that. It's an online program. These students know about that. And um, what that really does is it matches up well with the interactiveness and the data collection aspect of the actual NGSS test. So when students go to take this computer right, simulation test, um, they have experience with that. So we've extended the training down to um, grades six and seven for this year. So they have access to some professional development and we're piloting it with the grade six team this year as well. Um, upcoming, we summer curriculum time is gonna play a big role um, as we look going forward from the, the work of the vertical team and what the suggestions are and any revisions that need to be made um, curriculum wise. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. In the K-5 area, they use uh, something called mystery science, which is a lot of phenomenon and things that the students just kind of wonder about. Uh, I think Melissa, you had mentioned something about uh, kindergarten. In, it was in kindergarten. Uh, no, sorry, first grade. Yeah, um, I was saying to them at our curriculum meeting, I don't get much from my first grader 
of information that happened. Uh, but he keeps asking, he's like, when are we going to do science? It's also because my mom was a former science teacher and my brother's a science teacher. So he's, you know, surrounded by it. And he came home glowing from the lesson that they did um, with the shadows where they got to go outside and test it out for two different, you know, time periods and what changes. So like you said, getting the questions answered, wondering. Um, so it was, yeah, it was great. So it's really building up those foundational skills that will set them up for success at the middle and ultimately at the high school level. So a lot of great things um, going on K-12. Um, as far as those interim assess assessments that I mentioned earlier, those are integrated into the curriculum for grades 6, 12. So students have regular practice at the high school we're looking right now because of how robust they are once a quarter. So prior to this, we had no access to anything related to this. So it was teacher's best guess as to like formatting and coming up with something that might look like the NGSS test. So we were able to do that and we will continue to look at any uh, data that comes forward in future years and patterns um, as we look at our curriculum. Questions or comments? Okay. Thank you. Right. We will turn it over Thank now to Lori, Jeff, and Ross to talk about the SAT. Thanks. Appreciate it. Good evening. Jeff, just slide the microphone so you each have a mic. Okay, I'll be introducing the SATs um, and are going to transition to Lori for the results for the ELA and then also Ross will go over the math results as well. So the College Board um, administers this test. It's administered in the spring and March. Um, for the first time it was done online so that departs from that traditional paper and pen uh, examination. Uh, it's for grade 11. It breaks down into two main categories, English, language, arts, uh, also ELA and mathematics. And there's the achievement levels of one through four, those banded colors you saw in the graphs before. And it's grounded in literacy through the content areas. Um, I invite you to go to College Board. It gives you a really good job breaking down. The test scores are a little complicated to be honest with you. So I'll start with the easiest part, which is at the top. Um, there's a scale system, 400 to 1600, which is then broken down respectively into those two <laughs> section scores right there from 200 to 800 per evidence-based reading and writing and math. And then there's also, if you go down to cross-test scores, um, and they're scaled. So in analysis and science and analysis in history and social studies, uh, the students get questions right, and then they'll get the raw score, which then converted to a scale, and that's how you get that range for the total score. Then there's also three test scores breaking down to reading, writing and language and math as well, similar with the scale that's then converted over. Seven subscores as well, words and context, command of evidence, expression of ideas, standards, uh, standard English conventions, heart of algebra, passport to advanced mathematics and problem solving and data analysis. Um, so in sum, just the 400 to 1600 total scores based on all those subscores that have raw scores then converted over. Um, and again, College Board does a good job if you want to look for yourself how they do that. As you saw in the um, previous presentations, it's a ve very similar trend here, looking at the statewide data, where you see the 2018 in the blue and 19 to the 2021 uh, 2022 red, and you see just like you saw in the um, SBAC and NGSS, the dip in performance without the 2021 being reported uh, due to COVID and the breakdown between the groups at that time, which the state wasn't reporting the data. I'm now going to turn it over to Lori to start breaking down more of the results for the ELA. Good evening. Most of these slides are um, pretty self evident, but I'm going to attempt to provide a bit of context for you since I know you're taking in a lot of information this evening. The benchmark that College Board uses to determine college and career readiness is 480. 
in our last administration of the test, our average score of 522 is 42 points above the benchmark. So as you can see, we tested 234 students last year and 66.2% of those students were meeting or exceeding goal. While a first look at our data may appear that the percentage of students meeting or exceeding goal remains stagnant from 2021 to 2022, there are impressive results below the surface level to consider. While the state declined, or the state average declined from a 509 to a 501, which is representative of most of the districts statewide, Berlin students increased their reading and writing score from a 514 to a 522, which is uh, 21 points above the state average. Moreover, our 66% of Berlin students meeting or exceeding goal, um, as opposed to the state average of 55% is impressive. This slide demonstrates Berlin's consistent performance well above the state average from 2016 through 2022. This slide simply shows another view of the evidence-based reading and writing scores. Here you'll note that our largest percentage of students, 54%, fall into the green band or level three, with an additional 12% exceeding in the blue. One year ago, this slide showed 27% of our students in the red or needs to strengthen skills band and just 5% in the approaching band. Today, we see our red band declining to 11% with more students approaching goal. This indicates that the growth below the surface, uh, this indicates uh, the growth below the surface level that we'll talk about shortly. It is important to note that our student scores increased in six areas where the state declined. We increased performance with our overall reading and writing score, our reading mean score, our writing and language mean score, analysis of science, words and context, and expression of ideas. Our analysis of social studies, command of evidence, and standard English convention scores held steady with no change. These are three more areas where the state also declined. As a whole, Berlin did not dec decline in any subscore area and only improved where the state declined. When comparing our scores to schools within our DERG, this particular chart is interesting to me. If we look at the percentage of students meeting or exceeding goal, we rank 10 out of 24 districts. Yet, when we look at the column on the far left, I'm sorry, the far right, showing our average score, we're actually tied with Southington at number seven. So, for example, while it may appear that Clinton is ranked ahead of us with 69% of students meeting or exceeding goal, our students' average score is actually higher. This puts us in the top 29% of schools in our DERG, just slightly under the upper quartile and certainly within the top third. Uh, this slide, pretty uh, self-explanatory, shows our 2022 results by subgroup. Here we see that 76% of our students with high needs are meeting or exceeding goal, while 25% of our students with disabilities did the same. As we look at uh, some of our highlights, we must take into consideration that we are indeed looking at two different cohorts of students, likely with different needs. The data suggests, however, that work in our co-taught and in our learning center classes may be working toward marked improvement. In 2021, not a one of our students with an IEP met goal. In 2022, we saw a sharp increase with over 25% of our special education students at goal. This appears to be exciting progress. Additionally, 83% of our students with 504 plans are at goal, showing that accommodations are indeed working. Finally, our fastest growing subgroup population of Hispanic and Latino students saw a 28 point increase in reading and writing scores. This represents the largest increase in all student scores. We're hopeful that these subgroups will continue to experience upward movement this year. 
Our progress is in large part due to the commitment and shared efforts of the English and Social <coughs> Studies departments along with our co-teachers and partners in special education. In addition to the work being done at the high school level, all six through 12 English, reading, and language arts teachers are now working toward a common shared student learning objective related to reading comprehension and an increase in practice test achievement data. We continue to use data from Common Lit and Khan Academy for individualized and prescriptive practice. After rolling out common lessons in grades nine through 11 last year, we're now expanding our lessons to scaffold instruction in grades 10 and 11. Grade 10 expands upon the reading and test taking strategies covered in grade nine with material related to course content, where grade 11 focuses a little more specifically on those SAT um, test taking strategies and um, strategies for success in our subscore areas with a focus on the reading and writing. Together with the continued support and collaboration with our social studies and special education departments, I'm confident that we will continue to make progress with an upward trajectory. Jeff Kronk, our social studies department supervisor, will speak a bit to the ongoing work in his department. So on this slide, um, we actually used the data warehouse at the beginning of the year that was referenced, and we wanted to look at the PSAT scores to see what where our students are right now. We even looked at the SBAC data as well. While it's a different test, gives us a snapshot of where the students are at. And from there, we created student learning objectives that targeted reading comprehension skills. So in other words, all teachers were held accountable for all of their students and creating a couple IEGDs to measure growth throughout the year. And there were some comments made earlier about like a snapshot of one test. This is really good. It gives us like several data points throughout the year to really measure progress for all students. Um, in common planning time sessions, we actually have a great system in which we are analyzing reading comprehension passages that complement our curriculum. We're noticing trends of which questions are struggling with, which ones are doing well on, which is then informing our next steps moving forward. Um, for instance, there's three categories we noticed from the data warehouse at the beginning, command of evidence questions, words and context questions, and expression of ideas questions were the questions that students were struggling with the most on the SATs. Um, so we've also continued to expand our resources, including New York Times Up Front, New Zella, and Common Lit, all of which create SAT type reading passages for our students, along with the questions. Uh, foundational documents are also being uh, continuously blended into our curriculum. So for instance, um, articles of Confederation, <coughs> Federalist Papers by James Madison, like real pa documents we already use in the curriculum, we're now kind of tweaking a little bit to give a little bit more of that um, skill set that they need for this test. Therefore, we're also using mini lessons actually teach reading strategies of like how do you take apart a text of a structure. Um, we can also modify as well these different resources based on Lexile ranges to make it accessible for all of our students. So I'm excited for the work we're doing. I'm looking forward to the progress we're going to make this year. Good evening, everyone. I'm Ross Hansen. I'm a 6 to 12 math supervisor. I'm also Samantha's statistics teacher. <laughs> so if you think you've been looking at a lot of data tonight, just know she gets to do it literally every day in school. All right. On the current slide, uh, we have the SAT math data for our juniors since 2016. The first thing I would like to direct your attention to is the point of reference at the bottom of the slide. This says that the College Board, uh, this says that the SAT College and Career Readiness Benchmark is 530. The College Board, through a statistical study, found that if a student earns a 530 or above on the SAT, that student has a 75% chance of earning a C or better in their freshman year college level math class. Conversely, the English benchmark you saw was 480. Uh, the benchmark is higher for math because on a national level, students are doing better in their freshman year English classes than math classes. Accordingly, on a national, state, and local level, the proportion of students meeting benchmark is higher in English than it is in math. When looking at our data here, the number that used to stick out to me was the 36.4% of students at or above benchmark in 2021. Obviously, that is the worst percentage here, and it is evidence that COVID was detrimental, detrimental to our student uh, learning. With that said, after those results came out in 2021, 
our math team made a big push to help improve our student college and career readiness and performance on the SAT. I feel we accomplished that goal. The next year, we had 47.4% of students at or above benchmark, and how this was done will be discussed at a later slide. On this slide, we have a comparison of our school performance in math to that of the state. As you can see, for three years, from 2019 to 2021, we were almost identical to the state. Now please look at 2022. We were about 13 percentage points higher than the state. The success last year was definitely due to the curricular and day-to-day -day instructional changes that the high school math team made. Uh, for that, I am thankful to the high school math team for their hard work and dedication this past year, which allowed us to make this huge success possible. I mean, you could see the trend in the state going down, 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 and then, well, we, we made some active changes and we had results. Here we have a visual representation of the data from 2022. Red shows the percentage of students that did not meet benchmark, yellow the percentage of students approaching the benchmark, and green and blue the percentages of students who respectively met and exceeded the benchmark. On this slide, we have a comparison of ourselves to other school districts in our DERG. Uh, when looking at the data, you can see we are in the top quarter of districts in math. We're actually sixth of uh, 24. And please note, East Hampton is not the top district. Uh, their, percent, their percentage just isn't reported in the, it just, the computer decided to put them at the top. We are actually sixth of 24. Uh, the next slide is our results by subgroup. Sadly, our students that the state defines as high needs and students with disabilities do have a lower percentage reaching the benchmark than all of our students. Uh, this is the same trend that exists on both the state and the national level. Uh, however, it is a trend that we will continue to work tirelessly to address. And this slide here details our ongoing work and next, step, next steps. I attribute a huge portion of the success we saw this past year to the work that is detailed on this slide. The first change that we made after seeing the results in 2021 was to give our students a daily SAT practice problem in all math classes. The next thing was to have juniors analyze and do test corrections on their fall PSAT. This means, means juniors look through their item analysis and correct all problems they answered incorrectly when they took the PSAT. We also have students write and explain their new learning. So once they look at the problem, see what they got wrong, and they learn how to do it correctly, they have to put that into words. Because when you put something into words, you can explain it, then you actually understand it. Uh, during this time, teachers give individualized feedback to all students regarding their PSAT, uh, independent of level, every single student. We then give our students a practice test, SAT test in February. We felt that if our students are going to be taking an exam that will be used to determine their college future, it is important all students take a full practice SAT first. Uh, the PSAT they take prior is actually just a shortened version, so we want to make sure they have experience at the full thing before they actually have to do it. Um, after students complete this exam, we once again provide all students with feedback and have them do test corrections again, is the process that we did last year. And Melissa, to your point about test anxiety, it's our hope that just the more practice we give our students, the uh, we can reduce that anxiety somewhat. Just like in soccer or football, the more you practice, the better you can do and the less anxious you are when it comes game time. Next, students are also given individualized practice through Khan Academy and IXL. Students actually link their Khan Academy to their College Board account. So there's a partnership there. So they get assigned more practice based on their specific needs. So the College Board looks and says, oh, they got this, this, and this wrong in these areas. These are the extra practice we need to do. So it's an optimal use of student time. Uh, finally, some curricular changes were made. Uh, we removed the balanced algebra and geometry track. Uh, we found students were really stuck in these classes for three years and could not advance even when they showed the appropriate gr growth because it was a three-year mm -hmm. sequence, so we removed those classes. Uh, statistics and data literacy is a topic which both colleges and businesses have deemed to be very relevant nowadays that has been added to our geometry curriculum. And finally, uh, this year we now offer both AP Calculus AB, which is Calculus 1, and Calculus BC, which is Calculus 1 and 2. Before, we were only officially offering AP Calculus, AP EC Calculus AB. Thank you. Any questions? How many students take advantage of linking their Khan Academy to their college board account? And then Everyone. 
but oh, take like, advantage of it. I see. I see. So that. like, take advantage of like utilizing it outside of school, other than what's required. Great question. Yeah. So, our hope is. What we found is they weren't taking advantage of it, right? Right, right, well, at, at yeah. all. So then we Makes said, sense. if we do it with every single student yep. in the fall and actually dedicate some class time to it, show them the process, then uh, the we, 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 yeah, the buy-in and, and we get the increased participation. Does that data get tracked for us? No. So I don't know if it was okay. effective. However, we did see, uh, you know, we were at thirty-six percent. We implemented this new process. We jumped to uh, forty-seven percent. So. Hopefully that tells the narrative that, that it was helpful. Well, I think just, you know, implementing it in a class and a little bit a day is, yeah. you know, really great. I think it's awesome that you guys make the time for that. Thanks. And it, it's great because it fits right in with the with the curriculum, and it really a lot of the problems are application mm -hmm. of the curriculum. It's actually very rigorous, which is fantastic. That's what we're going for anyways. Yeah. What's really nice is that in our freshman year, our freshman school counselor comes in and visits every English class to ensure that every student in the building has their PSAT scores linked to College Board and Khan Academy. So starting with uh, freshman year, that practice is available for our mm -hmm. students. <coughs> Anything else from the board? Uh, great resources. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I heard I excel a lot. Isn't that the word? You can approach having 100%, but if you get one thing wrong, it knocks you back down. Mm -hmm. I've heard all it's the screams and yelling <laughs> in my house. It makes, you, it makes you work hard. Yes, it does. So, but I mean, mm -hmm. really, the, the resources for, for the students at, at home, um, I think, are, are excellent. Yep. 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 Yeah, I, I would echo that. And I also appreciate what you said about the statistical data and analyzing that for both math and businesses and that's huge right now and having an understanding of that leaving high school is such a big deal yeah we're really proud of that that change i mean that yeah. having statistics as a part of the normal math sequence right. is, is is not the traditional past hundred years algebra geometry algebra two yeah. but uh yeah the college board surveyed businesses colleges and they said hey we need this yeah. they added it to the sat and schools are now adding it to their curriculums as more of a regular pathway for students do you like statistics? I do. Oh, great. Yeah. You must have a great teacher. <laughs> that's awesome. No, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, for presenting. Patty Pyrus is now going to come up and present the eight advanced placement information. Thank you. You're welcome. I have more data for you. <laughs> um, but I'm going to talk about uh, student achievement in a lot of other ways. Um, we're going to start off with uh, advanced placement. Uh, so advanced placement is another um, opportunity provided by College Board. And um, it provides a lot of um, benefits to students. Simply taking AP classes improves their ability to uh, apply to competitive colleges and scholarships. Um, taking the classes also improves their readiness to take classes on the college level. And then, on top of that, if they um, do well on their AP exam, they could potentially earn college credit while in high school, which saves families thousands of dollars, potentially. So, um, this is a list of the current AP classes that are offered at Berlin High School, which you can see, the, you've got 19 of them, and they represent um, all basically of the, the different areas at Berlin High School with our core courses and our electives. So there's something for everybody. Um, the way AP scores are calculated is it's a one through five scale. Um, what was fabulous about the state of Connecticut a couple years ago is that they decided um, for almost all of our schools that as long as students earn a three, that they will count that towards college credit. So um, what's interesting, if you look at our students from Berlin, 100% um, of our Connecticut schools accept AP credit of some kind. Um, our four Connecticut state colleges and our community colleges, which next year are actually going to merge into one um, organization called CT State, 
um, they are going to award it for three or higher. UConn, of course, is holding out because they've got their own program they want <laughs> to take advantage of. Um, and nearly 60% of our graduates are going to college in Connecticut. So we're, uh, our students are definitely availing themselves of the opportunity <coughs> to take these, these classes and earn these credits. Um, this shows the percentage of students that are taking um, exams that are earning that score of three or higher. Um, it is dipping down a little bit, as we've seen with other, um, the other data that we've seen tonight. Um, another thing to note is that it's not required to take the AP exam. We do strongly encourage it. Um, and unfortunately, the participation rate has also gone down. So with participation rate going down, we'll also see um, potentially the students earning three or higher going down. How many, what's the percentage that take it now? Um, approximately. So the last year was 78%. And we last year you presented to the board about, <laughs> yeah, about that, right? I did. Yes. Because you, you were actively trying to increase that yes. number. We're, 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 uh, we actually met with all of the AP teachers, and rather than going with a punitive approach, which just didn't feel right, especially because there's right. a financial obligation connected to this, we actually want to put together something that incentivizes mm -hmm. taking the exam. So um, that, that is something that we're working on. We have a few academic opportunities that we can connect it to, um, as well as there are many things through College Board <laughs> that will also incentivize uh, taking the test. Do you so. think it's the financial aspect? why that other percent isn't, or just they don't no. want to take it? Honestly, um, I've uh, surveyed students uh -huh. each year as to why they're not. Um, a, a big chunk of it is that by the time the students have to take the exam, some of them already know what college they're going to, and so they're like, oh, well, I've got my UConn credit, so I don't need the AP credit. Or um, I already know what I'm majoring in, and this college is going to make me retake the class over again, so why mm. am I going to sit for this exam if I don't have yeah. to? You know, the senioritis stuff that kicks in. So, so that's a, a, oftentimes but what I we find. I think it's important to note that, you know, <coughs> it's kind of out of your hands, so you're trying to find a lot of the solutions. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it is important that they follow the whole commitment to taking the exam. I mean, that's part of what a college level course looks like, is you, know, you have a cumulative exam at the end. And so we want to encourage students to get that, that whole experience. Mm -hmm. It's more of a problem senior year than it is yeah. um, the previous years, mm -hmm. so. Definitely. Um, but we do <laughs> offer other uh, college-bearing uh, credit courses at Berlin High School. We are affiliated with UConn, which is our biggest affiliation, which you can see um, the, U the number of UConn courses we offer. We also are affiliated right now with Tonksis and Capital, which, as I said, next year will be called CT State. And so you can see we've got some business and um, technology education classes offered with them. And then um, this year we did partner with Southern for the first time and we'll be expanding that next year. Um, so we've got a lot of opportunities with students, which is kind of neat that you see on the, um, the next slide. Uh, with UConn in particular, uh, this is the most recent data that UConn has shared with us. We don't have the 21-22 bar on there, but it is pretty consistent with the 2021. And as you're looking at this, what you can see is it's comparing us and our offerings and our student participation to um, other uh, schools in our DERG as, weather, as well as in the state, and we are consistently higher, like, like dramatically so, which is pretty impressive. And we were told that uh, Berlin ranks number nine in the state of Connecticut of all the high schools that are involved with the UConn program with uh, 209 <laughs> students enrolled in the program, and we're number six overall in the state with the number of credits, uh, credit hours that students are pursuing. So that's pretty impressive. And you'll see here as well uh, the overall number of enrollments in the college credit-bearing courses has increased substantially. Um, I, we double-checked the data a couple of times, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is a huge jump this past year. But what you see is that we're offering more of these courses. We have increased partnerships, so we have got more opportunities for more students. This and I was yeah. going to say because yeah. we're missing, we're yeah. missing yeah. the twenty-two, twenty-three bar. Yeah. Oh. I'm like, oh, it went down. It's a good bar, though. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Well, it, it took me a little bit longer for that bar because I had to look <laughs> at it a few times. So I was like, hold on. 
um, because it was so impressive that I said it can be right. And but when you went back and looked at it, like offering the new classes we are, and teachers are really encouraging students to to push themselves and take these uh, rigorous courses. And we've got such breadth of courses that are being offered. There really is something for everybody. So we're pr pr pretty proud of that. Um, another thing that's pretty impressive is that consistently um, our graduation rates are uh, significantly higher than the state average. Uh, you can see we're roughly in that 90, uh, 95, 97 percent rate. Um, we're saddened by the 2022 went down to 94. Um, but again, we'll say again, it's it really think it has to do with the pandemic. We had um, eight students that transferred to GED program last year who started off that were struggling and then when they went full remote, um, had a hard time and when they chose, they could choose to come back, um, hybrid or stay remote, these students stayed remote and then when they had to come back full time, they really struggled with it. And so a lot of them were looking for ways that they could learn online at home. So uh, we do think that that's, that's an anomaly. Um, also our post-secondary plans uh, are pretty consistent from year to year. We have seen um, a little bit of an increase in students who are pursuing work. And again, it has a lot to do with you know family finances where families feel that they need to, um, students need to help out to support families because of loss of income um, and that kind of stuff. Um, but otherwise, we're still pretty consistent with a, a large percentage of our students going to four-year schools, two-year schools, or other types of education, which is very important. Um, <clears throat> in looking at that, we don't want them to just go to school. We want them to finish school. And so this shows the post-secondary persistence data. Unfortunately, 2020 is the last <coughs> um, uh, Connecticut State Department of Education that's been published. But you can see that we're pretty solid in that 93 percentage rate. The state average is usually between 87 and 89, so we're definitely higher. And our six-year graduation rate is at 70 percent, whereas the state is only 50 percent. So these days it's measured um, instead of four years as will students graduate in six years because it's more common these days that students are taking a little bit of extra time to graduate. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> but again, if they avail themselves of all these amazing credit opportunities while in high school, mm -hmm. we're helping to, to um, decrease that rate. Um, so, and then some other interesting things that just go above and beyond um, the classroom. We've got uh, one student that was a National Merit Scholarship recipient. That's like the top 1% of all the students that are taking the PSAT. Like that's so amazing. And then we've got four National Merit Commended Scholars. So just by taking the PSATs and, and excelling the way that they did and then applying and showing all the, the extracurriculars that they're involved in, they, our students are being very well recognized. Um, we also have one student that was recognized as a U.S. Prisoner Scholar candidate. Um, we got 79 students that earned a presidential award, 42 National Honor Society members, 19 Rho Kappa Social Studies members, 38 Community Service Citations, which means that those students perform more than 120 hours of community service over their years at Berlin High School, 21 Seal of Biliteracy recipients, and then 15 Capstone Exemplars. So I'm pretty proud of our students. Questions? I just want to reiterate something that, so for the benefit of the group, because I already said it to you all earlier, but um, I think the offerings, um, the college equivalent courses that are offered at Berlin High School present not just a great opportunity while in high school to earn college credit, but to offset what students and families have to pay for once they get to. And one of the things that, um, you know, I reflected, someone who works at one of those aforementioned schools, um, is that there is a, you know, a fair amount of attrition um, <coughs> when students enter our, um, when they enter college. And six years seems like a long time when you're 18 to 23 or more. Um, so I understand there, 
you know, their fatigue um, mm -hmm. once entering that setting. If they can offset that by taking more courses at their local high school and then not have to, families not having to um, pay that tuition at the college level, it's a win-win. I mean, I think it's a very sensible, you know, for pragmatic student, <laughs> it's a very sensible alternative. I can understand a student saying, like, why am I, why am I going to take the AP course if I'm going mm. to UConn, I'm already in kind of thing. I kind of get it. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, if they get college equivalent, um, and, and those readily transfer to their to their college um, of choice. It's a great opportunity. So we I, emphasize that quite a bit. It um, some students have taken a full year off of being in yeah. school, or some students can now finish in four years with a master's degree as a result of the extra credits. I will say too, the opportunity to take um, college credit bearing classes at the high school also there's a direct correlation with their persistence so one of the reasons why our persistence rate is so high is because they've had opportunities and it doesn't mean you have to load up your entire schedule with college credit bearing classes even if you've experienced one two or three you've had that experience and then and it gives you a little bit of a taste of what you're going to be heading towards when you move to post-secondary sure you know a, a lot of the students I don't, I don't know the percentage of, but we have a fair number of first generation students mm -hmm. at um, my university and having that experience of kind of dipping your toe in, right, in a, in a comfortable setting mm -hmm. in your local community and knowing that you can be successful at college level, um, you know, with college level curriculum is very um, confidence building, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. So lots of wins there. One more, uh, the, 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 the ability to take those college level courses, I mean, it's just, you know, looking at my own daughter, gives her the flexibility to now move some things around within mm -hmm. her college experience. Mm -hmm. And if she wants to study abroad at some point, she has that flexibility now without already having credit uh, going into it. It makes it a little easier. So it's been a great experience for her. Thanks to all of you. Well, I want to thank everyone for coming out this evening and being with us for two and a half hours. I know, <laughs> I know it's been long. We're not done yet. We're not done. Oh, no, no, no. We're, we're, not, we're not done. <laughs> <laughs> but everyone who presented so far, thank you. Um, I think this is a really important meeting. I think this is really important information that needs to be explained and gone through and given time. So thank you. And just thank a you. couple of things. Um, there's an appendix at the back if you want to look at it longitudinally data. You can take a look at that. So if you have any questions, you can certainly give them to Julie and she'll take them to Brian and her assistant to us. Um, also, we talked about um, separating the uh, presentation into two presentations so that we take a look at some more balance data. And then, and, and we've gone back and forth on what makes the most amount of sense. If you have another way that you'd like us to look at the data, please, again, give it to Julia. Julia will, will get it to Brian, and we can consider that moving forward. We just know that it's hard to stay focused for this amount of time at this time frame. <laughs> so, but we do Thank appreciate you. your focus on that. I, I think it's also one of the trade-offs going from two, two meetings a month to one meeting a month. We're going to have longer meetings, and, yeah. you know, it has, the information has to be shared, so... But thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. Thank, thank you. 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 Denise, regarding an update on administrative regulations pertaining to substitutes. Just to re uh, one second. recognize this is not a policy change, it's a regulation change, but we just thought, given the nature of it, that it's something that should go in front of the board and make you aware, um, because there are changes that we've had in place for a number of years, and, there, and one of the changes has to be applied to the annually to the state. So I'm going to let Denise take it from there. So. Uh, so as I mentioned in the comment section, our substitutes have been diminishing over the last six years um, tremendously. We did see a big drop off after actually the first year back from COVID. I think a lot of our subs stayed on the list but then didn't actually take positions. So we have 
gone down each year we were at eighty four subs in our pool about six years ago as of right now i think we're at thirty five because we did hire one more last friday but that thirty five includes sub paras who don't have the bachelor's degree required to be a substitute teacher so there are sub paras for para absences and there are substitute teachers for teacher absences um, we do have 11 full-time daily subs that are part of our paraprofessional union um, but this other group subsidizes those teacher absences and our fill rates lately have been less than what we are hopeful for so what happens when we don't have enough substitute teachers to cover the absences is that our paraprofessional staff who do have a bachelor's degree get pulled from their regular assignment so those subs could be pulling be pulled from our math or English one-on-one um, -on -one, so students aren't getting those services that they need um, so we're looking to try and figure out ways to increase that substitute pool um, so one of two things we're looking to do one is to increase the daily sub rate so right now our sub rate um, is a hundred and seven fifty if you are not certified and it's a hundred and twelve if you are a certified teacher we'd like to move it to a hundred twenty five for everyone um, we did a comparison of the other districts around and that would put us in the higher end um, not that much higher um, Newington offers 115 a day 160 for certified teachers New Britain is 115 a day Bristol is 110 Cromwell's 108 um, so this we figure this 125 would get us above the pool um, the second piece we want to look at is removing the requirement for the bachelor's degree uh, the state of Connecticut is the one that maintains the rules for what you need to be a substitute teacher and they do have a caveat it started with COVID that we could bring in folks who have experience with children who may not have that bachelor's degree we get a special waiver from the state it's an annual waiver for that particular sub for our particular school district um, and if we get that then we can look to hire um, folks who don't have that bachelor's degree so we would be looking at local colleges and universities looking at students who want to who are going into the teaching field and maybe they're a first year or second year college student maybe they have schedules where they have a Friday off or a Monday off or, and this gives them an opportunity to get in the classroom it gives us an opportunity to increase our sub pool um, we also would look to certify some of our regular paraprofessionals who don't have that bachelor's degree so we have more folks we can pull in if we needed to if they got the waiver from the state on file we could use those teachers so those would include paras who are actually in the classroom with teachers already they know the students they could easily step in for a day and do it where right now they wouldn't be able to do it because they don't have the bachelor's degree um, so those are the changes we're looking at just talk a moment about and I can speak to it there, there was a concern though about age appropriate to sub at high school Right. Do you want to share right. So one of the things that we are looking to do is, you know, send an email blast out to all of our employees now. If you have college kids, if they're graduates from Berlin and they want to come back and, and work as our substitutes, we certainly don't want to put anybody in jeopardy. If they're going to be substitute teachers, we want them to be 22 years old or older so that if they did graduate from Berlin, they're not back in Berlin high school. The high school level. Sorry, to be at the high school. So we're not putting them at the high school with peers that they went to school mm -hmm. with. Um, so we would certainly have that parameter in there but we could take a sophomore at Central and put them in an elementary mm -hmm. classroom and we could have a great substitute teacher in we there in the middle school and that. the middle school yeah a lot of districts have already moved yeah. towards that last year right yeah so yeah. Uh, locally we have <coughs> Newington Cromwell New Britain <coughs> Meriden are all already doing <coughs> this with the not requiring of the bachelor's degree right um, there is some level of experience that person has to have with children there is a form with the state that we have to fill out um, I we haven't tested it yet to see how long that return time is but I anticipate it would be rather quick because it's all electronic and, mm -hmm. and it goes right to them do you know how much success those other towns have had with these similar campaigns because I, I mean I don't know okay. um, we're in do you yeah New Newington has been had success really? you look at the, oh, very successful you look at the rate that yeah. Newington's paying now so for a certified mm -hmm. teacher yeah. 160 dollars a day Newington has I don't know if it's the rate mm -hmm. I'd ask the superintendent if it's the yeah. rate or it's the, the model mm -hmm. I think but, it's both. But, but we're in a neat we're just looking at the numbers here be at 84, you know, six, seven years ago, to be down to 34. And look at the age of our subs, and we're not getting new, you know, new kids or something. Well, yeah. unfortunately, mm -hmm. we're, we're not getting across the state. I mean, yeah, we're also getting not new. You're not, not getting new teachers. Yeah. You're not getting new substitutes. <laughs> I, I know that we right. just, I mean, we just increased our rate to $120. And you know what we got? Nothing. None. 
the college because kids people know. don't want to do it. Mm. <laughs> so for the college kids I've seen in my district, it has been Same pretty successful. Parents, there's a thousand vacancies in the state right now. Mm. Yeah, yeah. We were on the phone with the <coughs> para union. You guys yeah. go last we're gonna night, try our hardest. We're gonna, you know, we've try. already got. Right. We've but spoken about getting those stickers on the Berlin that's, Citizen that's and trying to promote mm -hmm. getting yeah. folks to come on and apply and give it a try. Yeah. I think the college students do like it from me interacting with them. I've talked to them. A lot of our administrators have their kids who are home for the, like, you know. Right. For the winter break and then the summer because that ends in May for them. And they, they do pretty well with it and they enjoy it. And I haven't experienced any issues. They're pretty enthusiastic. Um, they're, they're like working harder than. And they're the ones who know people. best what they're walking into because they were yeah. just in high school a few yeah. years ago. So it's not as scary, I think, but in that mindset either. In that noon to Nautilus, they're paying $150. But that's for certified teachers. Certified. They're paying uh, 115 for non-certified. So those would be these non-bachelored people. So yeah. I think. Yeah. Why well, we're also anticipating open, yeah. our sub pool like age yeah. is we have like 47 percent are 65 and older. So that group is also going to be. And the biggest concern yeah. is. Yeah. Denise tried to explain the biggest concern is. The continuity of instruction where we're pulling paras mm -hmm. and other staff members mm -hmm. to fill. And it's odd way because we always have open positions every day. We have building, permanent building subs in each building, but they're utilized as two in each. They're utilized all the time. So they're gone. So then, then it's the paras, and then it's the actual special teachers to cover. So the continuity of instruction of those students is definitely broken up. And, and, and that's, we have to do our best not to have that. Um, so the, I'm sorry, Brian. Go ahead, go ahead, go. No, I was just going to say this is, you know, I don't know if it's necessarily symptomatic of a larger problem, but, you know, to Linda's point, there's just a, an incredible shortage. So, I mean, even going into local colleges or advertising to local colleges, you know, I know where I am, we have seen a, as and has been, you know, this is, we're not unique in this regard, um, a decrease in students enrolling you know, seeking to become teachers. So this is a, a much bigger issue. And I think that we have to start thinking strategically, not just this Board of Education, but folks who work within this field, about how to actively recruit folks into the teaching profession because it is a, a global issue right now. So, you know, yeah, it's a, it's a big deal. And not just for teachers, specialists as well. Right, when you can go work in an insurance company and start at 65, 70 for entry level. Yeah. Or more. Or more. It's, it's a problem with, with this. I mean, the whole industry. Yeah. 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 We, we were spending some time with the para union representative um, on a conference call trying to figure out ways to incentivize paras because they're, as soon as we get them hired, they're turning around and leaving us to go someplace else because mm -hmm. the work is hard and we don't pay very well. Mm -hmm. and So we'll keep our fingers crossed and hope that this works and uh, and we I can would build up our pool. And if any of you are interested in sub teaching, <laughs> come on down, give it a whirl. I would also encourage you, you to send it to. Oh, you um, can as for it. Well, then send your children. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say cast as wide a net as possible. So send it to all of the schools that prepare teachers in the state. Yeah. Um, not just you know the ones that are listed on the agenda right now because it can't hurt. Right. But I also would reach out to deans of college of educa colleges of education and um, and see if we can't come up with some innovative pathways to get people in. You know, the one piece we talked about is when you have a college student who maybe has courses three days a week mm -hmm. for staff to say we'll guarantee you subbing on those days because we know we have, so you'll know you'll have 
you know, Tuesday, Thursday, every Tuesday, whatever, because we know it's one day a week, it's still one day at 140 right. hours. Right. You plug into your schedule. So, you know, we're, 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 we know it's not just by raising the rate and yeah. lowering the threshold. We hope that during around the holiday break that we'll have college students, then come early May, mm -hmm. we do have college students, but it's, you know, it's really building that number back up into the 80s and 90s like we used to have. So. And if there are, you know, students who are, um, you know, who are pursuing the field, if it could be something that, you know, they presented in such a way that they get in, gain experience in the district, but then maybe have opportunities to do their student teaching within the district as well. I don't know what sort of, I'm just trying to think creatively, but. There are some colleges that, are, that have an, a teaching internship program mm -hmm. too. Yeah, so that's true. Yeah. Those too as well. Yeah. Sure. Um, we have a Good one. All right, thank, thank you. Thank you. to come present this. Um, I received a request from the Chair of the Board of Finance, Al Bornero, uh, regarding um, the cost of the transition <coughs> and just some specific questions around that. And it was, it was important to me that not only do we, you know, provide them with the information, but it's really important that the Board also receives the information. Um, their meeting is tomorrow. His request was that he receive it prior to tomorrow's meeting. I said that um, they would receive it after tonight's presentation because anything that's shared out with, you know, whether it's town council, board finance, anyone else, I think it is important that first we see it, we have the opportunity to go through it, ask questions, um, and really address this in the most um, public facing, transparent manner. So if and when questions are raised about the integrity of the spending and the budget, um, it is all recorded. You can go on the YouTube and see it later on. It's all been shared with the board at the same exact time. Um, and it's all been shared by Ashley. It was shared this morning at our FNO meeting. Brian and I have gone through it a few times beforehand. Um, and it's just, it's important, especially, you know, th this is a very important program that we run for our students to ensure equitable educational opportunities um, at the best cost possible, so. Just to that vein, um, Linda Holian's also here, just to make, to make, you know, Ashley gave us the financial numbers today, and Linda will speak to the purpose of the Transition Academy. I know that the board knows, but for a public record, so you can have that brief overview of why we have the transition academy and the purpose it's serving. So there isn't any action being taken tonight, so we don't need a motion or anything. So if questions do arise, feel free to please engage in the conversation and the dialogue. I would much rather have us as a board do it here, like I said, in the most transparent public facing way, rather than have these conversations after the fact. Um, so. Thank you for both being here to go through this with us. Sure. I'm just going to give you an, a little bit of an overview about transition um, and what that means. Every student who receives special education services and who has an IEP, an individual education plan, has to have transition goals and objectives starting in middle school. So our students start these transition skills from middle school all the way up until they earn through their four years of high school. Some students need more than that. So that, those are the students that attend our Transition Academy. So our students at the CCTA are students age 18 to 22. Um, they've completed their four years of high school but require a transition program with age-appropriate peers before moving on to further schooling or employment. Um, the program includes practical, academics, vocational skills, vocational internships, social and community activities, and daily living skills. Um, and that most of all, the CCTA provides an environment within the student's least restricted environment in their community. You know, this is Berlin and Cromwell that came together that we don't want to outplace our students into other community programs. We want to keep them in our community. 
what are practical academics? So practical reading and writing are taught throughout the school day with the students. It includes reading information on social media, recipes. Some of our kids are going through the driver's educational manual. Actually, a lot of them are so anxious about getting their license, <laughs> we sit there to encourage them. And I think two or three of them right now have their permit. So they're trying to take the driving um, skills outside of us so they can get their license because it's only going to make them more independent in the community, whether they want to go to school, whether they want to um, have a job. Reading clothing labels, calendars, menus, banking accounts, resumes, applications. So that's just all the practical functional academics that our students work on in reading and writing. In the math area, they really look on, work on personal finance skills. Um, and it's taught and reinforced through our stipend. So all of our students <coughs> receive a stipend because they all go out to jobs. So that is a, just a natural way to learn how to budget. Um, they all budget together about their community activities. Okay, well, how much money do we have to go on? Uh, they went to Dave and Buster's, you know, but they had to make sure that they had that amount of money in their accounts to be able to do that. Um, they plan their grocery list for the week because they go to Stop and Shop every Monday, um, and then they have to bring their lunches on their work internships throughout the week. So they all have a bank account next door, um, and that's how they do the practical um, math skills. We always are working on communication and social skills um, with the students. They practice these on a daily basis. A lot of students continue to have to learn how do you initiate a conversation with someone that you don't know or that you do know? How do you maintain that conversation? Um, some students, the, all the students are responsible for calling their transportation or their employers if they're going to be out sick. Um, that's that self-advocacy skills. Some students are taught how to make their own medical appointments, whether that's with a therapist, a doctor, a dentist. Some are hair appointments. Again, it's all tailored to what these students need. Um, while others are taught how to navigate services at a local community college, some of our students are attending um, Gateway Community College right now, or they're attending Tungsis. So what are the disability services at those colleges mm -hmm. that are available to them? <coughs> Then some students, we work on daily living skills, um, and then, again, being in the community. So as I said earlier, our students participate in a weekly community experience, either as our group, our CCTA group, or they get together with other transition programs. Um, this, this is a time, really, where they really can work on generalization of those skills, whether it's the math skills, the reading skills, the, the social skills. Um, and some students really need to, to work on those daily living skills. Um, they learn about nutrition and making healthy food choices, appropriate dress tire. Sometimes they come in, they know, hey, I'm going to FOSDAC, and they may not be dressed appropriately. So we, we have to have a conversation about that. Do they have other clothes that they have to put on? Is their hair brushed the right way? Have they brushed their teeth? Um, it's all of those natural you know, skills that we take for granted sometimes that these are specific instruction that some of these students need. And the biggest part of our program is the vocational skills. So each student participates in a number of different work experiences at different businesses in the community. A lot of them are in Berlin. We're trying to get more in Cromwell because we have Cromwell students. Um, they typically work between 12 and 16 hours per week. Some work one-on-one -on -one in a job site. Some work as a group with job coaches. Um, as the students progress, we encourage them to try more challenging tasks, work longer hours, function with increasing independence. And most of our students, when they're ready to be let go onto their own, they do walk away with a job. Um, some of the places right now, they still have some of our former students they hired. One of our students is aging out in, in April. I think he's getting hired He's getting hired in a few months right now at the Jerome home. Um, we have some students that have been employed at FOSDEC for a couple years, and that's where they got some. So our employees, that employers that we work with, love having us there. Coles loves having us there. Um, and then there's always opportunities for our students to actually be gainfully employed. Some of our students are gainfully employed at our cafeteria at McGee, um, working alongside our cafeteria workers there without any job coaches so that's what the program's all about it's probably one of my favorite programs to talk about um, and thank you for supporting I, it took us a long time to get it out of the high school and into the community where it belongs mm -hmm. so now 
Ashley will talk about the money part. <laughs> before, before you yeah. do, um, Linda, can you just talk about what is the typical profile of a kid who attends the Transition Academy? It used to be a typical profile. I we know. don't have a typical <laughs> profile yeah, anymore. So it's highly variable. It is variable. We have students with intellectual disabilities, students on the autism spectrum. Um, it, it really is wide <coughs> now. Um, I know the answer to the question, but I'm going to ask it publicly. Do we have to offer this for our students, or is it something... Like, do we, do we, are we mandated, or do we have yes. to offer this? Okay. Yes. So yes. if we didn't have it here mm -hmm. in Berlin, what would happen? It actually will show, speak oh, to I'm that. Sorry, no, <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> we would have to outplace our students. <clears throat> and I'm sure she'll get into more different programs. Of that. Yep. Okay. Yep. So we do have to do it. We yes. Don't yep. I mean, not every student's eligible. Again, it's a PP PPT well, right. decision it's to say who needs further work in those transition skills, which is employment, post-secondary, and independent living. Right. Those okay. are the three areas. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Linda. So I'm going to jump right into it. First of all, I'm going to go into what exactly a per-pupil is. So the per-pupil expenditure determines the total amount local, state, and federal governments spend on education per student. And it's a pretty basic calculation, and you just take your total expenditures and you divide it by the total number of students within the district. Now, to get the total per pupil, there's actually two steps to it. First, you have to determine the program cost. So that's all of your expenditures in a particular program or building divided by the enrollment of that particular program or building. And then you have to take the district costs, so that includes things like transportation, district salaries like the superintendent, people that work for the district as a whole. And you take that number and you divide that by the total district enrollment, which includes our outplacement, um, our outplaced students. Um, so you take those two factors, you add them together, and then you get the total district or total district pu per pupil expenditure. So um, this Financial data comes from fiscal year 22, as well as the enrollment data from the same fiscal year. This comes right out of our um, educational finance system report that we have to um, complete <coughs> at the end of each fiscal year. It is audited by the state of Connecticut, and then it is audited again by our private auditors here. Um, the whole purpose of the EFS is to make sure that districts are spending um, the same amount on students, so the spending is equitable within programs and buildings within the district. So um, our total district per pupil expenditure is 20891 Our total in district, so that does not include any outplacement, is $20,065. And our total uh, per pupil expenditure for the um, CCTA is $21,096. So the per pupil compares, how does it compare with uh, other programs within the district? It aligns <coughs> with other students or other programs within the district. And um, it is aligns with the district per pupil. That's the red line on the graph on the right-hand side. And then the top point on the, um, on the right-hand side graph is the out-of-district pupil expenditure. Um, so the... Out of district per pupil expenditure is $43,613. And that includes um, 96 students. <coughs> of those 96 students, that includes the students attending a magnet school program, a VOAG program, or a special education outplace. So basically, those 96 students are uh, tuition based programs. One thing to keep consider is of the magnet school um, enrollment, we have 68 kids um, in the magnet school program. Of those 68 students, only 52 of them are actually tuition students. So the major cost driver for your um, special education or for your out of district per pupil expenditure is special education costs. <clears throat> so in August of 2021, we partnered with Cromwell, um, and this program um, 
it's not modeled like some of our other partnerships that we have with other towns. So um, Open Choice, for example, we get a fixed dollar amount for every student. It's a grant amount. We, that doesn't change. Uh, this is a fixed cost or sh um, program. It's a shared cost program. So um, we calculate all of our expenditures, and then we invoice Cromwell quarterly for those expended, uh, for those expenses. Um, some of the eligible expenses are certified salaries, non-certified salaries, employee benefits, field trips or community services, um, utilities, transportation, supplies, and licensing and fees. Um, things that are not fully reimbursed are the facility improvements. So um, because we do have the lion's share of students attending the program, or most of them are resident students, we do the, uh, any kind of facility improvement on a pro rata base based on enrollment. And then administrative salaries are not reimbursable. Each, each um, per, uh, pupil personnel supervisor takes care of their own resident caseload. So um, for any kind of PPTs that for a Cromwell student are handled by Cromwell's administration, any PPTs for Burlington students are handled by Burlington administration. So we take a look at the district enrollment for the program. Um, so fiscal year 22, we had uh, 14 students, resident students, those are students who live in Berlin. We had four Cromwell students, and we had two open choice Hartford students for a total of 20 students in the program. Uh, for fiscal year 23, we have 15 Berlin students, 10 Cromwell students, and one open choice for a program enrollment of 26. So um, as you can see, we are still exceeding um, 50% enrollment, so when we share our costs evenly, we're, um, it, it benefits the town significantly uh, to, to be in this partnership. So the program costs for fiscal year 22, total expenditures are $298,237. Uh, um, this, this number is slightly different from the number that you saw on the first table, and that number is a transportation cost, so the difference is $2,000. Uh, $113, and that's just because uh, any kind of transportation is considered a district level function, so it is accounted for in that um, um, uh, $6,290 figure that you saw on the first table. Um, and the last thing I want to say is if we um, outplace these students, so I'm going to go back to this particular table here. So um, because we have to educate these students to the age of 22. Berlin would be responsible for uh, for providing services to 15 students, or, or 14 students. I did this exercise based on fiscal year data 22. So in fiscal year 22, we would have had to um, offer these services to 14 students. Before we had the program run in district, we uh, outplaced to Farmington Valley Transition Academy, and their current year, um, their uh, tuition, rather, uh, for that year was uh, $54,313. <coughs> and um, so if you take that times the 14 students that we had enrolled, it's um, $760,382, which is $462,145 higher than the program cost for the transition academy. Can we just pause and see if anyone has questions? Yes. <laughs> that doesn't include transportation. Yeah, Do you mind? Uh, no, that doesn't include that transportation. That doesn't include transportation either. Yeah. So what questions do you guys have so far? No, it's just right. It doesn't right. include transition to the farming and valley. Correct. Correct. So a couple of questions. I see that we're at 26 for this year. Uh, I'm going to ask actually Brian's question because uh, Sunday's question is going, how many would we be able to accommodate? Yes. What would be full capacity? as it's housed right now. Linda, the number I gave this morning, max, with the renovations, the way things are, I said 40 would be packed. That would be packed. We would need more paras. But you know what? That's hard, so th that's hard to answer, too, because not all these kids come five days a week. Right. So some kids come one or two, some come three or four. So we may be able mm -hmm. to do a significantly more, but we would need more paraprofessionals. But, yeah, the facility could definitely take 40. Just looking at, like, if we were going to have that and because I know this question is out there, and I even hate to ask it because I, I hopefully we don't have any Cromwell residents watching, but Cromwell's paying what you're invoicing, correct? Correct, yeah. So it's, it's not like they're not paying, because there's some rumors out there. That 
Oh no, no, they, 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 <laughs> and okay. I, there's also and it's all documented and audited, correct? Yes, yes, yes yeah. When right. I take intuition revenues, yes, it's audited. Yep. Um, I, I think there's another misconception that um, even when we were tuitioning Cromwell, they were only pay, paying um, a similar, uh, a very minimal dollar amount. Even when <laughs> we were tuitioning Cromwell before we had our partnership, it was always minimally the per pupil expenditure or more if they required additional services. So it was never just a <coughs> random amount. If I remember from the story as well, is if a student requires uh, any additional special services or one-on-one -on -one <coughs> paraprofessional services, that is, that is formed by the residency of the student. So That's if it's our student, we yes. pay for that yep. if it's from a student. Because yeah. right now we have a, a student that needs a nurse. It's our student. We pay for that nurse. Cromwell has two <coughs> students with one-to-ones. They pay for those one-to-ones. Okay. Yeah, for some reason, there was a um, misconception that it was $8,000 per student. The choice reimbursement was $8,000. Was. Was prior to this year because our rate has fall, fallen below the 4%. Mm -hmm. We're now in the 3%. So this current year and moving forward, we're at six thousand dollar reimbursement for choice students, so I just want to make that. I know someone said too low, which is totally separate. The choice reimbursement has nothing to do right, with right, right. 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 transition academy. Exactly. Right. Thank you. It's, it's also our goal. I keep saying this, though. Unfortunately, more and more public schools keep partnering, <coughs> growing their own programs. We would love to take tuition kids in mm -hmm. at some point. We had Plainville call us last year to inquiring about our program. They never followed through, so. You know that's a goal too. At some point, we're at we're ready now to take students in from other towns if they're looking for other programs. But Ashley, you just said that if we had to send out those students mm -hmm. without transportation, just tuition, just tuition, it would cost the Board of Education an additional four hundred and sixty-two thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Tracy, did you have a question? Oops. <laughs> so I got a couple questions, sure. and, th and I probably know the answers to mm -hmm. them. But so I thought you were going to say something else when you mentioned that number, the eight thousand. Also, rumor has it Cromwell only pays eight thousand dollars to us per student that attends the transition program, and we pay like fifty. Could you clarify if that's true or not? No. So Cromwell is billed quarterly, and. Um, they get, so what happens is at the end of each quarter, I go through all the salaries, benefits, contracted services, anything that's utilities. eligible for reimbursement, utilities, um, anything, with the exception of administrative salaries or one-to-one -one things. Um, all those are tallied up, and then it's divided by two. And uh, first quarter, you typically get around $25,000 second, third, and fourth quarter, because fourth quarter has the balloon payment, it's usually around $50,000. So uh, last year alone, we took in about $166,000 from Cromwell to offset the cost so of the, the program. So the reason why that wasn't included in here is because it was never asked for. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, 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 that's totally <laughs> fine. Because I know there's a lot going out and about. There's, It just says, uh, the only request I got, and I think it's important, we as a board are talking about it, and it's on public record, so anyone can watch it. However, when Ashley put this together, she put it together based on the original request that says, um, and I received this from Sal Board Nero on November 22nd, at our last Board of Finance meeting, <coughs> one of our members requested cost information for the Transition Academy. Please provide the per pupil expenditure for this program. Also identify the facility cost portion that the per pupil expenditure period would like to have this information prior to our December 13th Board of Finance meeting. So, so I know there's misconceptions out there about the reimbursement. We've all kind of heard different ramblings about it. However, we didn't include that because it wasn't asked for, but I think okay. it's important we're talking about it. This is the place where we need to talk about it and have these conversations, but I, I wanted Ashley to kind of focus on what was asked rather than starting to just like throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks. 
Okay, and the 298, 237 mm -hmm. that you came up here, so that's what it costs our district to run this program, correct? Correct. Yep. Okay. Now, does this, it, I'm sorry? Does this include? Yeah. No, no, the number you have here, Ashley, is just our cost. Yes, our just our cost. Just our yeah. cost. Right, that's what I was going to say. And so if, we, if, we put, if we put Cromos right next to it. No, no, no. These are all of our expenditures. This is over Cromos. And Cromos. See, that's, 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 that's what I was yeah. going to say. That's, that's why yes. this that's is the total cost. This is the total and cost of the program. The Cromo amount that we get at 160 yes. bucks, like she said, you could subtract that. And so it's really even less. I subtract. Yes, that's what's thousand dollars yeah. from the two ninety eight. Yeah. Yeah. That might be yeah. you might want to I, I asked her not to system. put it in oh, because I'm it was sorry. never we can talk about it here, that's fine. <laughs> but to share with the Board of Finance, they never requested that. They never okay. questioned it. So why are we gonna put that in? Because we were just fulfilling the only request that they asked for. So, you might you might want to clarify it though. I mean, I even if it wasn't clear. requested, yeah. I think it would be helpful for the discussion. I think it would be something if, to add to the, for them. We, if we put in the cost to the county program, mm -hmm. yeah. hundred sixty six thousand less, mm -hmm. or right next to it. Yeah, they put here's the total. Well. Here's the own share. Here's the right. share. Yeah, <clears throat> we could do that. It's not a problem. I think on a, I know we're talking numbers and things here, but I just think on a real practical sense to go down and see what goes on in this transition academy and how well the students are doing in this environment, I think that anyone would be impressed whether you're an educator or not. So, I mean, I would encourage anyone who's questioning what's going on in the, in the, in the transition academy for their students and success that the students are having and how well acclimated they are and, and what they're gaining by through this program, I, I think is something to be commendable for them. So, mm -hmm. I, I would encourage if anyone wants to go down in the public to have a view I would more than welcome at the Transition Academy. I know that, Linda, you'd make that happen. So. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I uh, would, before I was on the board, I um, was a para, and I actually worked in the transition <coughs> program at, that when I was at the high school years ago. That was my favorite place to sub. Yeah. My absolute, 100% ab favorite place to sub. What was interesting is how much I learned. I think as parents, we take for granted the simplicity of, of life, like, um, ordering food at a restaurant, having enough money and calculating your tip. We just do it automatically, we don't even think about it. And I'm sure a lot of our own children, it's just, you, you teach, the school teach, whatever, it's there. But those that are struggling and have needs, it's it, those simple tasks can be very difficult. And then why don't parents teach it? That's another question that people, why, is your, why don't you teach your kids how to do the laundry? Why don't you, have we all tried to teach our children especially children that have needs, they don't learn from us, the simplicity things of, of life necessarily. And um, I just, I can't, I mean, you guys are amazing anyway, but it, the absolute life skills that are being taught that we take for granted, like people who may not know, it's, they, I mean, it's incredible and they need this. This is, it's like common sense to some people, but it's not. And the location just makes it. I mean, one student came down, he needed a haircut. He couldn't get it. She says, go right, right across, across the street. The street. <laughs> go. <laughs> go on your own. Figure it out. Or, you know what? You guys came back early. You want to get a coffee? You want to go to Dunkin'? Go. You know? So check your account. Do this. Because some of these kids, once they go home, they don't leave the house. Mm -hmm. You know? So this is just getting them more comfortable in the community. Mm -hmm. Learn how to take the bus from here, because you could pick it up right there, all the way to Cromwell, um, to Walmart. On your own. We'll meet you there, but <laughs> make sure you got there, but on your own. So. <coughs> so just to clarify, um, how much was Cromwell invoice for out of the... Yeah, out of, out for the four quarters, um, $165,973, so it'd be a round up. 973. 973. Um, and, and that is out of the 298-237. Um, so our portion that we paid was 132-237. Mm -hmm. And if students are outplaced, what's that total cost going to be? It's 55,000, 54. Uh, yeah, 54, 330. Total 700. So 700-something mm -hmm. thousand. A student, <laughs> which, yeah, which I just calculated for 14 
two vans that were being... Plus transportation. Yeah, we, this was just tuition costs, not transportation. Okay. To that place. Plus, if we had to do that, the choice student, too, we would have to pay $8,000 of that. Because we, or whatever we six. get, we get six. So we would have to pay 6000 towards the tuition. I'm just writing it in the email that I'm sending. So it's going to be included. Um, and, you know, yeah. Any, I, I want the board to ask questions now, ask any clarifying questions, address any misconceptions, any concerns. So I'm just going to throw it to you guys now. Thank you for putting all of this together. It, it's very much appreciated. Um, I know you spent a lot of time on it, and we've gone back a few times over it. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Okay, so moving on to our second to last item, policy revision, the second reading and adoption. So. At our last meeting, we had the first reading, and Shipman has recommended two new policies and revisions. Um, would you like to add anything about these? No, most of the policies, well, I can go through some of I know we went through them in the first reading, but the policies that are updated are because Shipman is recommending based on legislation that we update the policies to meet the law for the most of these. The only one, the high school graduation requirements, we talked, Eileen talked about that this evening, that all have flexibility um, in their senior year. The other one that's here, I believe, is our uh, renaming of school buildings. That's our own policy that we had shipment draft. Now we're updating it. That was based on discussion about the number of the length of time before we decide to name something. Mm -hmm. So those two are ours. Um, but the rest, I believe, are all policies. Yeah, their policies align with legislation to make sure we're, our policies are aligned. So. Do we have a motion for consideration? I move that the board adopt the new and revised policies number 1181, 4118.2, 4118.31, 5141.21, 5141.25, and 6146 as presented. Do we have a second? Second. 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 Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 7 0. All right, last item on the agenda. Motion to adjourn. Do we have a second? Yeah. So, motion by Carrie, second by Matt. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, 7 0. There better be cookies left out there. I'll tell you right now. <laughs>